Welcome to the Cannabis Investor Series. Join the Canadian Securities Exchange and our partners as we present a first-hand look into the rapidly evolving cannabis industry and the opportunities that lie ahead. Featuring the experts and influencers who are gaining insight into the challenges shaping the next phase of this industry's growth. Learn about what's next in American cannabis, how cannabis culture and capital markets are converging, the life-changing innovations in health and wellness, which are shaping our economic realities and world ahead. Finally, the impact of a growing global acceptance of cannabis. Where education meets opportunity, subscribe now to the Cannabis Investor Series. Welcome, everybody. It's the Cannabis Investor Series. I'm your host today, James Black, and I cannot express how grateful I am to be joined today by my co-host, Jay Rosenthal. Jay, welcome to the Cannabis Investor Series. It's always good to be with you, James. Uh, always be always good to be with uh, whatever the Canadian Securities Exchange is doing. So thank you for having me. Our pleasure. So obviously, this is episode three. Uh, thank you if you've joined us uh, for the first time, we've we've done two of these episodes already, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about a bit more during this episode. Uh, but this is Cannabis Health and Wellness. This is episode three of our four-part part series, the Cannabis Investor Series. Now, Jay, you've joined us today as not just a co-host, but also a co-sponsor, a media sponsor for the session. And maybe just tell the people, what is Business of Cannabis? What are you guys doing? What are you up to these days? And uh, what, what are you excited about in the cannabis industry? Well, there's lots that I'm excited about. I'll get to that in a second. But Business of Cannabis, we started in 2017. We like to say we highlight the companies, brands, people, and trends driving the global cannabis industry. I say that a lot, so it just rolls right off the tongue. But what we've really become, especially during COVID, is we are really a cannabis industry, mostly B2B place where high-level and thoughtful conversations can happen. Professionals can connect with each other. We provide really valuable content, insight, events, um, services uh, to the cannabis industry. And uh, which gets to what I'm excited about. What we spent a lot of time over the past, I would say, six months talking about is cannabis retail. Because here in Canada, where we're located, that has been just a massive ramp up. Like if you think about this time last year, COVID notwithstanding, we have been... Uh, you know, it's gone from, you know, we've exploded the number of stores that has major ramifications for an industry, products, brands, uh, providers, service providers, like it's just exploded. We spent a lot of time talking about that. I think we're also going to spend a lot of time talking about um, really the, the, I don't know what the right word is, but specialization within the sector, right? Like it used to be, and it wasn't that long ago. And many of the companies listed on the CSC and other words, like we are everything. We cultivate, we extract, we make products, we create brands. We actually have a retail presence. We, you know, we have medicine, like all, all things to everybody. I think we're looking at conversations happening in other parts of the world, but even here in Canada, like it's going to be a game of specialization, right? We just right. did an interview with a contract gummy manufacturer here in Canada that didn't exist a year ago. Like there's going to be specialization like every other sector. And that's exciting to watch from a business perspective. I'm not sure the outside world like is super interested in it, but I'm like a business nerd. <laughs> And more than that, like a cannabis business nerd. So that has interesting ramifications and conversations. But one of the things we're talking about today as well is like the health and wellness component is really, I think almost cannabis 3.0, like the way we describe cannabis 1.0, flower, you know, legalization, all that, 2.0, edibles and beverages and all the fancy products. But 3.0 is really how cannabis will integrate into people's lives, people who don't use cannabis recreationally or even for medicine, but also like in your health and wellness whether it's CBD and sports beverages or topicals that may be on the shelves at your local, you know, um, convenience store or uh, grocery store or pharmacy, like that really is bringing it out of a dispensary, out of a cannabis retailer and right into people's lives as they do their regular everyday shopping. And that just creates enormous opportunity. And that's exciting too. So I don't know, that's, yeah. that's all the things, but I am excited about all those things. No, I'm glad you shared that with us. And, and there is a lot to be excited about as this uh, series has demonstrated. Um, just a reminder, everyone, if, if you can hit uh, subscribe, if you're on YouTube, if you're watching on AirMeet, you know, hit the chat today. Let us know where you're calling from, what you thought about the series thus far and what you're thinking in real time. Uh, we like to treat these uh, these episodes sort of like watch parties because, yes, there are some pre-recorded segments in here. And um, it, it's what's allowed us to produce all the quality that we've presented today and last week and the week before and, and next week, which we'll talk about a bit later. Now let's um let's maybe just get into it. Now one thing is it says on my screen here, JB the producer. Uh, it's supposed to say James Black, but uh, the reason is I actually had to come in today and uh, and uh, fill in for Anna Saren. 
she sends her regrets. She really wanted to host the session today. So Anna, um, take care out there and uh, we'll see you soon. And uh, obviously we wanna, wanna make sure you're okay. So, um, but there's lots of Anna on this and lots of Barrington as well, who you all know from previous sessions. So you'll get your fill of your favorite hosts if uh, you know you weren't expecting me today. <laughs> so uh, like I said, there's five segments today. The first segment's, uh, it's basically like an update. It's an update about uh, what's happening in medical cannabis, um, you know, taking a look at what's what's being, you know, proven to have efficacy and uh, the status of CBD, you know, and, and the treatments being used for CBD. So I don't want to spoil it too much. Um, it's about 30 minutes and, uh, you know, Jay's your host in the sec segment. So Without further ado, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys enjoy that segment and enjoy the watch. Coming up, a panel conversation with Paul Rosen, Sherry Boudram, and Blake Pearson. Paul Rosen, the CEO and chairman of 1933 Industries. In addition to that, he's got a long and storied history in the sector, and we'll get into his history, how it informs his leadership today, and where he thinks the industry is going. Both in the US, but also in Canada as well. Uh, Sherry Bridgham is a PhD. She is with CanDelta, which is a leading cannabis science and regulatory advisory based in Toronto, but working throughout Canada. She's got a background actually from Health Canada, which brings interesting expertise. And we'll dive into that with her about where she thinks um, cannabis, wellness, health products are going. Um, and Dr. Blake Pearson, um, he was actually one of the first people to ever speak at a Business of Cannabis event about a million years ago. He's the founder of Greenly Health, which um, evolves the field of medicine by getting physicians comfortable with using cannabinoids in clinical practice. He's also the founder of Pearson Health, which is a virtual clinic that focuses on cannabinoid and functional medicine and a variety of diagnoses, which we hope to talk to him about as well. So we're going to talk to them about uh, cannabis, health, wellness, CBD, uh, how it's regulated, how people are using it, what it means for the sector and what the future may hold. So without further ado, I'll be joined by Paul Rosen, Sherry Boudram and Blake Pearson. Paul, Sherry, uh, Blake, thank you for being here. I was going to call you Dr. Pearson. That's probably more appropriate. So, uh, and I called Sherry Dr. Uh, Dr. Boudram as well. Um, Thank you all for being here. This is an exciting week, and we are going to be talking about uh, sort of the intersection of health, wellness, cannabis, a little bit of industry stuff where it all coincides. So thank you all for being here. Um, if I may, Paul, I'd like to sort of talk to you first. Um, sure. You've been at this sometime uh, in the cannabis realm. Um, sure. You've seen the sector grow, stumble, excel, fall back. But one thing that um, one thing that sort of continues to amaze me. Uh, is let's call it the CBD craze um, as it relates to wellness. And I guess from your earliest days in cannabis to now, is that a surprise to you that this has become like the hottest thing in sort of public conversation as it relates to wellness? Or did you see it coming or were hoping for it or some combination of those things? Yeah, I'm not a soothsayer, but I did see this coming. Uh, I just think because it was all the sort of ingredients were there. Uh, as early as I would say 2013, I, I actually was thinking about this idea way back then about creating a, a CBD infused coconut water because I love this idea of taking two hot emerging trends and then mashing them up to make you know even a, even a better trend. So I more or less feel comfortable to say that I anticipated that CBD would be exactly what it is now, which is a very important input into cosmetics, a very important uh, health and wellness product. And the part that I did not necessarily anticipate was uh, the US uh, under the farm bill, essentially treating uh, CBD, as long as it's uh, with a THC content below 0.3%, uh, treating it and not derived from the cannabis plant per se, but from a hemp plant, treating it as a non-controlled substance. I didn't see that coming. In fact, I would say that's almost like a, a, a weird paradox between America and Canada. In Canada, we have full adult use cannabis. In America, everyone knows it's a broken model. But in Canada, CBD is still a controlled substance. Crazy. It's going to change, no doubt. Um, so, yeah, I feel confident to say that um, I believe for early on that CBD was going to have a profound impact on the CPG industry. Yeah. And it, and it clearly has, even in this sort of... Uh, it sort of took people sort of by surprise, maybe that that it was going to be in the farm bill, hemp derived, and even states are having trouble sort of figuring out what that means. Uh, but it has sort of caused this boom. And I, I'll go to uh, Sherry next because, as Paul alluded to here on the Canadian side of the border, CBD products in general are treated as they might as well be cannabis. But they might as well have THC in them because you can only buy them um, within the sort of framework of the Cannabis Act. Uh, and you, as a both 
former Health Canada person, but also as someone who deals with this every day, there has been talk on the Canadian landscape that the regulations may change to include cannabis health products. And I'm calling it, maybe I'm calling it wrong, I'm calling it cannabis 3.0. Like if 1.0 was legalization with dry flower and oils, 2.0 is all the other goodies, edibles, beverages, all that, extracts uh, or concentrates. And then 3.0, a world with cannabis health products is, is the, the lingo we're using. What might that path be? Is it realistic? Is there a time horizon? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm really excited by this category for sure. Cannabis health products, I think, are a long time coming and Health Canada has kept their their pulse on I think where the industry is going where trends are going what the public is saying you know they they are public servants so they are keeping an eye on that um I you know Health Canada has had a a consultation uh it was the ending it was last it was 2019 time has gone by so fast now that we've been uh in quarantine but um it was last, uh, it was 2019 June, Health Canada had a consultation to get consumer or public feedback on where they would like to see this proposed industry going and if there's even any interest there. So the pathway for that, if, if, if it you know were to be rolled out, would be a hybrid between what we currently see, which is, you know, the recreational regime, as well as the the, the medical cannabis regime, um, operating you know simultaneously, as well as the 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 cannabis products that are considered drugs containing cannabis, and those are the products that have scientific uh, data to support it. There were safety and efficacy studies. They've those products have gone through market authorization. They have a drug identification number. They require prescription and physician oversight. So you have those two categories of products. So cannabis health products would fall somewhere in between that, recognizing that there are therapeutic uses for it and you know potentially for treating minor ailments. So Health Canada recognizes that there's definitely some, you know, there's something there. There's some advantage of having a middle ground. And, and, and trying to figure out what would be the safest way to roll that out um, that would still meet their objectives of you know, the, providing for the safety um, of Canadians. Yeah, it's also interesting because it's like on the sort of adult use side, whether Health Canada moves on it or not, people are, people are using it, right? And they're gonna find it, whether it's through the, the, the regulated mm-hmm. channels or not. And it's like this give or take, like, And it sort of pushes the envelope, I think, a little bit. And actually, to that point, uh, Dr. Pearson, um, uh, like this um, explosion of CBD conversation as it relates to sort of health and wellness, have you seen that change the way other doctors that you help train on sort of uh, cannabis-based medicine, like think about this or open their eyes to it or put pressure on them? Like, uh, do you see those two things like being, like putting pressure on each other? It's interesting because it... It almost blurs the lines for physicians, which when you are as passionate about cannabinoid medicine as I am, that's a little bit of the frustrating part is because when I'm teaching physicians, we're going over how specific doses of CBD can manage things like anxiety, certainly um, manage um, refractory epilepsy, and even dementia responsive behaviors. So when you're, when you're t- talking to physicians about that in a very clinical setting and you want them to maybe even take that first step, maybe with like a chronic pain patient, then having it available through other channels blurs the lines. It really, a lot of physicians who maybe were on the fence might just say, you know what, I don't really want to learn about it because they can just go to the store and pick it up when it's through that channel. So it's interesting because I, I don't doubt there is a there's a space for CBD in that wellness category, but it's just it's it's also tricky when people then may self medicate if they're using it for mo- for anxiety or for sleep, and uh, it's good to include the physician in that discussion. So it kind of blurs the lines, but I do think there is kind of a a niche to be carved out for for both areas. Yeah. Can we can we stick with you because um, you obviously you see patients you talk to doctors who you're who you're training to sort of work in this realm and and what have you seen uh, and pick an area because you mentioned dementia like where have you seen sort of firsthand where the biggest results or best results or more most efficacy or people finding relief from pain like where where are you seeing the best results from this as you talk to patients and other doctors so 
It depends. And, and that's one of the biggest things when I'm, when I'm working with other physicians. Again, a lot of people want to lump cannabis into just one, one broad kind of topic when it really is dependent on the THC CBD levels for specific conditions. So you're talking about dementia. Generally, those patients, um, it is a mix of THC and CBD for their responsive behaviors. So that's, that's kind of the term for the agitation, the calling out, getting out of bed, verbally aggressive, physically aggressive with staff. And usually THC is, is uh, often needed for those patients. But if you want to flip the script to the CBD side of things, certainly um, a lot of physicians are comfortable. It's almost that's where they want to dip their toe in the water first uh, because of there's no impairment, of course. Um, and we do see efficacy in um, some of the chronic pain patients. And certainly with everything with the pandemic, I have um, a lot of patients and a lot of the physicians I, I train and educate using CBD knee, uh CBD now more um, in the area of generalized anxiety um, and other mental health conditions. Yeah, um, and, and that's that's helpful to think about. And actually, Sherry, this lends itself to a question for you as the way sort of you're viewing how Health Canada and your former colleagues are thinking about this. And that is, uh, you know, we have uh, we've talked about cannabis 3.0 and maybe cannabis health products getting to shelf. But one of the other big regulatory sort of things to wrangle with is how medical patients actually can access medical cannabis in Canada. And it is like this unique model that they go to a doctor, the doctor authorizes it, they take it to a licensed producer or increasingly to like a shopper's drug mart, but it's not take it to your local pharmacy, get get a prescribed mm-hmm. that way. Is there a conversation in your mind to, to make the streams even more disparate? Like there is the rec stream and then there is the medical stream and the medical stream looks a lot more like traditional sort of how you access pharmaceutical drugs. Like, do you think that is also something that's coming down the pike in Canada? Yeah, yeah, definitely. The The consultation was very clear on trying to um, come to some conclusions on what the, the public and not just the public, but healthcare practitioners felt comfortable with in terms of accessing um, cannabis health products. Um, there were conversations originally um, from Health Canada around having cannabis health products um, being sold through provincial retail stores. Um, the consultation um, showed that there were concerns from the respondents about the retail store employees really lacking that that education that's needed for selling a health product. And it, it really would be considered a health product at this point because the CHPs um, are proposed to actually have health claims on them. So at that, you know, with that being said, the, the, the employees are not necessarily, even though with training, they're, they're, they're you know, not really in the position to be um, giving any advice on, on those types of products. Um, so what is being proposed and what, what's kind of being leaned towards now is um, considering selling these products in pharmacies. So that would allow for, um, it would limit the, the risk of confusion by the consumers. Um, and it would it would generally be safer. It would also reduce the risk of stigma because now that it's in a, in, a, in a pharmacy, it's not just you know a cannabis product only used by people who are you know heavy cannabis users. And unfortunately, there is really that stigma that's still occurring in much of society. Right? There are many people who don't even want to step foot into a cannabis retail store. I mean, now there's curbside pickup in Ontario. So, I mean, that's, I think people feel a little bit more discreet about that and having deliveries, but, um, you know, largely I, I you know, even personally, I know a lot of people who are not comfortable stepping into a cannabis retail store. So yeah. having, having it in a pharmacy, I think would be huge in terms of, of, of access overall. Yeah, I, I think so as well. And Paul, I want to go to you because you have an interesting lens, I think probably because you have a lens, obviously, of what's happening in Canada and you all, you have a lens of what's happening in the U S as well. And even though they are totally different, but each state also has its own unique way that people can access medical cannabis, how they actually get it to their home or to their, to their person. Um, And it's changing every day. And I guess, is that change, like, does it lend itself to just people being confused and like, I don't know what to do, or is it more like people are in each state are finding their own path to use cannabis as medicine or as a health and wellness product? Like, how are you seeing it from, from your perspective about people are accessing cannabis, both recreationally, but, but I think importantly as a sort of health wellness tool. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot to unpack here and a lot of what uh, Sherry and Dr. Pearson covered, I, I'll concur with. But my view, and this really is not US versus Canada, this is a global cannabis perspective. We don't really have, in the truest sense, medical cannabis right now. I would say there's three categories, adult use, recreational, nutraceutical, uh, which is almost really what we're saying medical. And then right now, essentially Epidiolex, an FDA approved medication for Dravet syndrome, uh, that is a medical product. And I think that the confusion right now is that there's a total conflation of these markets. And as long as, if you will, a bud tender, a well-meaning bud tender is helping a patient make product decisions, that's really not a medical market. At best, it's nutraceutical. It might be recreational. And uh, the it's the same thing in the United States. You'll see that one dispensary is operating with both a medical and a recreational license, but it's the same economic transaction. It's not like there's a different, like you, oh, you're here for medical purposes, meet with our doctor. It's the same tattooed butt tender, if you are giving the same advice. So I think my view is that the medical market is going to explode, the true medical market, because there's a number of drug development initiatives underway, uh, addressing all sorts of important uh, outcomes, including dementia, including Parkinson's, including ALS, including chronic pain. But for it to really be, you know, if you will, medicine where my doctor would prescribe and I would pick it up at shoppers, you really do need to have the efficacy that say a three-phase test can offer in the medical market. And that's coming. It's just should be noted that the only reason that there's not more, if you will, approved products is because until recently, it was a don't fly zone for pharmaceutical companies. Epidiolex, GW, they've shown what's possible. And so my view is the idea of like Shoppers Drug Mart selling anything other than those products in the dispensary to me is not long-term durable. I could see them having, if you will, when I go to the part of shoppers uh, where I could buy Jameson vitamins, then I could see CBD products on that shelf. But where I get an approved medication from a physician, then it should be behind the dispensary in my opinion. And what I think what will happen is we'll see a cleave off. The medical market will behave like traditional medicine. The adult use market, which will include nutraceutical will, behave like traditional nutraceutical and CPG. And I would say with all due respect to the government, you know, kind of like do your part to accelerate this partition of these of these different, um, if you will, factors or, or markets, because it does create confusion. It really does create confusion. Uh, and I think that to Sherry's good point, if somebody is in need, but is afraid to walk into a dispensary, because they have some sort of like reputational concern, that's a problem because we're then having, if you will, an access issue. The only reason we have a program in Canada is because of the constitutional guarantee of, afford of access and affordable access. So in the States, the truth is there is no real medical market except for Epidiolex. There's just a early stage medical license being turned into a full-blown CPG offering once an, an economy goes adult use. So if you go to Florida right now, where I've been many times, when they eventually pass whatever bill they're going to pass to have adult use cannabis, it's going to operate under the same distribution system that their current medical market does. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, and I don't mean to sound flip, but within that confusion right now, especially in the States, like, is that a business opportunity? Like, you know, to, and it's not your, it's not, it's nobody's fault. It is the confusion that is there. Among well, consumers and patients. A business opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's a massive opportunity too to, to delineate those lines. Uh, like Paul said, it's, it's so gray in the U S here in Canada, at least it's somewhat clearer. It's still kind of gray, but I think there's a huge opportunity um, for companies to really focus on that medical side. Again, right now, a lot of the physicians are just, I don't, you know, I'm hands off because it's, it's available or I write my card, the patient goes to the dispensary, that's the extent, but there's a huge opportunity to have clinics with physicians who are knowledgeable prescribing certain amounts of THC and CBD. Um, yeah, I think there's huge upside there as well. Yeah. And, and I wonder, um, th there's like, we can talk about the what a perfect world will be like with two separate delineated things and maybe a third wave, which is sort of the 3.0, like in pharmacies, like over the counter, sort of next to the Jameson uh, vitamins, um, which will be very confusing to talk about CBD gummies <laughs> and the problem of gummies and others. But, but Sherry, like you have a lens on this, like, is it realistic? I, I guess maybe not realistic, but a timeline, like 
what we've seen in uh, certainly on the Canadian front, but also the U.S. front, like nothing moves quickly except people's uh, attraction to this, right? So like the, the, the people are moving faster than governments can respond. Um, and like, it, like if, if you were to bet and you would mm-hmm. say, and you don't represent a publicly traded company, so it's easy or easier to say like, okay, you know what? On the Canadian front, we think by, you know, COVID will hopefully end at some point, 2022, we'll really dive into this. And maybe January, 2023, we will have products on regular shelves. Like, is that realistic or possible? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's it's, it's going to be delayed. I mean, we're in cannabis. And I think that we all know that it's the government, so things are always delayed there. I speak, uh, you know, fairly regularly. I have contact with the the director of the Strategic and Horizontal Policy Division, which is the division that's leading this initiative and and the legislation. Um, and as part of the rollout um, and you know, really deciding on if this is a viable um, you know, market that Health Canada should create legislation for, um, Health Canada has established a scientific advisory committee. So along with the consultation, they have all that feedback. They've put together a scientific advisory committee that has the goal of bringing evidence and having an evidence-based approach when they're assessing, you know, the feedback from the consultation, what's currently known about, um, you know, health products and what the safety is of use for cannabis on, um, you know, different therapeutic uses, and bringing that all together to to come up with a plan for legislation that really makes sense and is reflective of the needs of the consumers and also the healthcare practitioners as well. And, and having something that's, that's really safe for everyone. Um, the scientific advisory committee was, they had nominations last May. The, the committee met for the first time at the beginning of November of last year, um, just to, you know, established their terms of reference, the ending of November to the beginning of December, they had their, I would say their first real meeting where they've gone through, you know, the history of the cannabis framework in, in Canada, the different types of, I guess, pathways that currently exist um, and start looking at the, the, the evidence um, around cannabis in general. Um, so they have, according to their terms of reference, a year from when they were established to provide feedback to Health Canada on you know what is the safest route to 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 go with this um so that would bring us to fall of this year so or the ending of of this year around november or so um and they should have something prepared to present to health canada on their findings um and their recommendations and then health cancer review that so then that will bring us to beginning of next year or so i think we'll have maybe maybe something um and then give it a little bit of buffer so i would say if i were to guess maybe summer of next year there should be something that's at least being discussed with the the or presented to the to the public and then of course you're going to have to draft the regulations that will probably take another year <laughs> realistically right so well well i mean actually, it's, it's better than nothing <laughs> well it, sure yeah in canada to me i just think it's insane that you need to have a doctor give you cbd that has less than 0.3 percent thc content that is just absolutely nonsense and where it's costing our development of our industry canada was supposed to dominate global cannabis we had for a while we're falling behind because of no disrespect um insensible rules like that where there's literally nothing to be afraid of here it's just cbd what there should be is authentication of supply chain i get that but you know this laqua i'm drinking somebody's making sure it's not full of shit if you will for me but it doesn't require a doctor to prescribe it for me we could just have our food and safety make sure that if you put it on the label it actually what is in there is matches up with the label we don't need to have you can ask your physician i could ask my physician what about melatonin? They can offer me opinion, but certainly I shouldn't need a physician to get melatonin. And I'd say CBD fits exactly in that category. It, it does, Paul, but certainly along the lines of if someone has, I'm with you, like I think there should be some over-the-counter CBD, a CBD wellness product. I'm totally with you there. The only thing is on my end is that person who, you know, let's say they've got generalized anxiety and they're, they're not talking to the physician about their mental health because they're just, I'm just going to handle it on my own. And that's where I think the lines hopefully can be drawn. Like, I, again, I don't think that there isn't a place for over-the-counter CBD, but I still always would like, if we're, if we're dealing with a 
a medical diagnosis, then for sure you want to run it by your nurse practitioner or your physician, whether it's over the counter, whether it's prescribed, it's just kind of good practice too. I would no. say I could no. see both your your points there. I think that CBD is it, it should be considered differently than THC. I think that it you should consider the risk profile yeah. of CBD. I do see the benefit. This is a CHP category that healthcan is considering. They're considering it without healthcare practitioner oversight. That's you know the way that they're sort of framing it and trying to see if that is really a feasible model from the consultation. I know I keep going back to this, but I, I love data because it's I'm a scientist. <laughs> but uh, you know, 40% of the, the the healthcare practitioners were against not having health healthcare practitioner oversight. I mean, they're a little bit biased, of course, because that's that's obviously, um, you know, their job. And the same thing with, with veterinarians. Um, they also agree that there should be some oversight as well. Um, it, but the basis of it, I think, is what's interesting. And they're saying that the reason for that is because they don't feel that there's enough evidence, that there's a lack of evidence. So I'm curious to know from, from Blake's perspective, I don't know, I'm, I'm taking over as host, but I'm curious to know from Blake's perspective, if he's finding that there isn't enough um, data out there to support some of these therapeutic uses. Um, but I also see Blake's point also as of, you know, if someone is coming to you and saying that they have mental health issues or they're trying to treat it for pain, and that those are the, those are the, some of the, the uses that, that CBD products are really geared towards, that a lot of people have said that that's what they want to use it for. They want to use it for pain management. Um, they want to use it for sleep or they want to use it for um, mental health right? And anxiety and stress and things like that. So, and, and we, we know from all these conversations more recently about mental health and, and going to seek the right assistance, right? To, de to deal with that properly. You want to be able to have those conversations with someone who's directing you down the right path to really alleviate what you're feeling, right? So I think that maybe it doesn't necessarily need a prescription in the, in the same traditional sense. Maybe it does. But I think that there still needs to be some oversight to some to some extent, you know, maybe maybe not necessarily a healthcare practitioner, like a medical doctor, but some sort of oversight um, on this. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and kind of on, on the end there. Yeah, like it's, it's one of those things where um, if if they are tr trying to treat something medically, sure, speak to your healthcare provider. Um, again, I do think there's a space there for, for over the counter and kind of to your question, Sherry, around the, the evidence, I often, I often call it a perceived lack of evidence. Like it's this narrative, there isn't enough evidence, but when you look at the National Academy's review from 2017, it's, it's robust. There's 10,500 studies and conclusions drawn on some of the main things like chronic pain, like MS, chemotherapy induced nausea, vomiting, um, it's just, it's just that perception uh, and that narrative that because there's maybe fewer randomized control trials that we're used to, to make a claim, that then null and void all that evidence, whether it's case studies, observational studies, um, case series, patient testimonials is kind of null and void. So I, I work with physicians and kind of opening their mind to the, the whole um, body of evidence, and also always like to point out when they suggest a lack of evidence that we're often prescribing things off label uh, for pain, like gabapentin that doesn't have, you know, a lick of evidence at all. Uh, so it's it's one of the, with respect to chronic pain, and uh, it's just it's one of those things where because it that something like gabapentin went through the pharmacy it's perceived okay to use off label. And there is this kind of double standard with respect to cannabinoid medicines. Yeah. That almost highlights the fact that there's still so much stigma around cannabis, like yeah. even, even by what you've just said. Yeah. Well, yeah. Still, we still have kind of the, the uphill climb. Yeah. Like it's we okay do. for pharmaceutical prescription drugs, but cannabis is a different story. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we do. Uh, and um, I feel like every time I say something like what I'm about to say, things do move drastically. Like, when we said last May, like, hey, what do you think we'll be talking about in May 2021? Like the world has moved dramatically even from last May, right? Like I think there are leaps and bounds. And sometimes, as Paul was saying, like in unexpected ways, like the farm bill that opened up a CBD sort of uh, bonanza in the States. Uh, but I hope 
we can come back next May and talk about where we were right, where we were wrong during this conversation. And I'm also hopeful that um, uh, that we get to see everybody in person at some point between now and next May. I'm I'm hopeful we were. I don't know if we will, but but it is always nice to share a Zoom screen with you uh, and, and and ask you guys questions and pepper you like this. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Blake. And we will connect with everybody um, soon because we do talk to you guys a fair amount. So thanks, everybody. Nice to see you. And thanks for being with us this week. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm sure you, this is the first time you've watched that. Did, do you have anything that sort of stood out to you the second time, uh, you know, as an observer, as a, you get to witness that discussion? Is there anything that, uh, you know, you want to really, that really impacted you the second time around? Aside from Dr. Pearson having a beard and he didn't used to have a beard pre-COVID, um, yes. <laughs> I, I, I actually think it's the almost the totality of it, right? You have Paul coming you know, he has a, a U.S. perspective, but he obviously has, <laughs> he lives here, um, like about the wellness, especially CBD and sort of how that's considered differently and what that means for people in their lives and also for the sector. I think Sherry has maybe better than anyone a beat mm -hmm. on what, like how the regulations may catch up and on what time horizon so that we may be more like the U.S. on the CBD front in terms of patients and consumers and, and their wellness. And I think Dr. Pearson also like, you know, he's obviously steeped in the medicine and how he prescribes it and how other doctors are. So I think it was a great conversation of like all those things coming together and like the different pull, push and pull from regulation, safety, consumers, patients, wellness, like there was a lot there. Um, and I think the different viewpoints were helpful to consider almost in a nice 20 something minute chunk because it's not simple, right? Like it's not, if doctors just prescribed it more, we'd have more because that's not it either. If Health Canada would just loosen regulations in Canada, we would have this bonanza. I don't think that's it either. And the U.S. approach, I think, of course, seems like we're all, you know, the grass is always greener, but I'm not sure that would be particularly good if we did that here for the cannabis industry as it is now. Like, I think there's lots of things to think about and mull over. And I think they've surfaced a bunch of that. So I'm not sure it was one thing, but almost the totality of it. No, fair enough. I mean, it's it is a complex web of of regulations and uh, many other factors. You know, two weeks ago, if you're watching and you didn't see it, please watch our uh, American investing in American cannabis uh, segment because we go state by state. We basically just try to you know figure out you know across all the states in the U.S. Um, there's different regulations and rules that have all come in at different periods of time. And it's just created a, a real interesting uh, kind of mess, <laughs> but yeah. also a huge opportunity, as Paul uh, has alluded to at the start. You guys actually missed that part, but he actually says it's a huge opportunity still, and uh, it's something that we should all be pretty excited about. Um, so, Jay, the, the next session I want to I want to tee up here is, uh, and again, we we had a taste of it last week on our uh, culture of consumption, um, athletes and cannabis, and you know how are they using it? What's changing across the major sports leagues? And uh, our host, Anna Saren, got to sit down with uh, Ross Regliati. I, I can't say his last name right, but Elias Sorodoru, and, uh, who's an MMA fighter. And you all know Ross. He is a, a decorated Olympian uh, snowboarder. And uh, in this chat, they kind of just break down how they're using cannabis, where they see it going as far as athletes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting little cross-section of where things uh, are going in that realm. So... Uh, join us on the journey. I'll queue up the, the tape here and uh, join host Anna Saren, uh, Athletes in Cannabis. Awesome. Hi, my name is Anna Saren. I'm Director of Listings Development with the Canadian Securities Exchange. And I am joined today as part of the Cannabis Investor Series with not only one, but two all-star Canadian athletes, professional athletes, um, who have had a history in both uh, professional athlete, being a professional athlete and the cannabis space. And today we're going to talk about how those two worlds have collided for them. Uh, mm -hmm. So first I'm joined by Ross Rabagliati. Thank you for joining me, Ross. And Good to be here. <laughs> and Elias Theodoru. Thank you for joining me, Elias. My pleasure. Um, but I'm going to just let you guys start off by telling us a little bit about your background as a professional athlete. Ross, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, Ross Rebliati, uh, most notably that I won the Olympics in 1998 in Nagano, Japan for snowboarding and tested positive for THC in my uh, drug test where they 
then stripped me of my medal for a couple of days while we appealed and uh, eventually got it back. And so that's been my story for the last 23 years. Uh, I spent those years, you know, speaking out in favor of, of cannabis and why athletes uh, would choose cannabis. Um, I've been an advocate for legalization over, you know, over the decades and even had a, a dispensary um, several years before pre-legalization here in Kelowna. Um, yeah, it have been a big part of um, my life and as an athlete, it's been a big part of my life. So um, it's good to see the, the full circle. Back in uh, in 98, you know, cannabis uh, wasn't on the list of banned substances. And so I was able to keep my my medal. But now uh, this year in, in Tokyo for the Summer Olympics, they're not even testing for cannabis. So this is uh, a full circle, um, you know, 23 years later to, to see uh, the freedom of cannabis kind of being uh, allowed here and there. Well, and as Elias said in our pre-chat, it's amazing that it happens to be in Japan again, Ross. That's crazy. It really is full circle. Yeah. <laughs> um, Elias, please tell us about your background as a professional athlete and how you are involved in cannabis. My name is Elias Theodore, a professional athlete. Uh, I've been so for about nine years now. Um, I started my professional career at, um, working my way up to the UFC, where I won the um, famed uh, television show and reality show called The Ultimate Fighter. I was the first Canadian to do so. Uh, and in there, I was um, a, uh, a fighter who um, started my career uh, and my actual understanding with cannabis as an observer of a uh, coach and mentor who's had his own medical cannabis journey for uh, the better parts of a decade at that point. Um, then from there, as an athlete, watching, I later um, developed a relationship as a patient where I uh, used chemical cannabis um, for my bilateral neuropathy, uh, nerve damage of my upper extremities. Um, and I eventually uh, focused uh, with my cannabis relationship, at, not only as a patient, as an athlete, when I applied for what's called a therapeutic use exemption. And in, in that, um, I applied for a therapeutic use exemption to use cannabis in competition, um, the first to do so in, in um, through USADA via a professional venue in the UFC. It was unfortunately denied, um, not by the merits, but more by the uh, stigma that cannabis has, uh, still being a schedule one drug uh, in the US, so they didn't look at it as any medical properties. Um, then when I left the UFC, uh, being a free agent, I was able to be an agent of change for medical cannabis as I applied for a therapeutic use exemption with the Athletic uh, Commission in British Columbia, where they accepted my therapeutic use exemption on its merit and afforded me uh, my charter rights and freedom uh, to use medicine as prescribed by my doctor. And that created precedent not only for myself, but all other athletes in British Columbia as uh, both MMA and professional boxing and amateur boxing, uh, mixed martial arts as well, can now apply for a therapeutic use exemption uh, if warranted. And beyond you know, the aspect of testing, this is the first time that cannabis has been uh, actually recognized as professional, or sorry, as a medicine in professional sports. And from now, uh, again, I continue to fight uh, both in the cage and out uh, for medical cannabis rights. Well, uh, you know, thank you to you both, because you both, um, I think one of the big things is um, coming into the world of sport. It's the stigma that really does need to get pushed aside. And we really need big advocates and people that have big names out there and big followings that help push that along. Um, I guess my next question is, and, and Ross, we'll start with you. What are the purposes or what are the uses that you feel cannabis is used within um, as as kind of whether it's pain management or mental mental health as as an athlete? What is cannabis used for? Well, a big part of it is mental health um, that, that I can speak to that in a second. Um, but as far as the physiological end of things, uh, topical creams with CBD and THC infused um, infusions have been really um, effective, um, over the last little while since they've been working on the formulations. Um, so as far as like aches and pains and, and sore muscles after training or, or, um, after an injury, any sort of inflammation that you might have from a post-op surgery that you can, you can use on, on your, your scars and things like that. So those are, those are some really great breakthroughs, uh, your, your athletes can, um, use on a overall basis. And then, um, you know, for me personally, I had issues with jet lag, 
um, you know, with, with my um, career, I was traveling a lot through um, Europe and Asia and North America all throughout the season. So I, I found it uh, extremely helpful to um, help me eat when I didn't feel like eating when it was dinner, but I felt like it was breakfast or if I was supposed to go to sleep, but it felt like I was, it was in the middle of the day because of jet lag. These are all things that I've, I found to be super helpful as an athlete to keep on a schedule, um, basically early to bed and early to rise and a healthy appetite. You know, we're burning thousands and thousands of calories per day. And we're, at, we're training at altitude, especially in Europe. And so um, I found a, a way to kind of keep a consistent um, um, way forward as an athlete, where we're always in different hotel rooms, always in a different country or a different time zone. But if you're able to access cannabis, and of course, I'm talking about the 90s here, where we were steeped in prohibition, borders everywhere before the EU. and um, you know, zero access. We really, it took years to make the connections um, that we made in Europe so that we didn't have to travel throughout Europe and going through borders from, you know, Switzerland to France or France to, to Italy or whatever it was. Um, and so nowadays it, it's a little easier in Europe, but still it's not, they're not quite where we're at. Um, but yeah, those are, those are some of the main things that I think an athlete would, would really benefit from. Elias, what about you? My actual, uh, you know, beginning in like journey with um, uh, cannabis and plant-based medicine uh, very much started um, as a athlete viewing, uh, you know, a, a coach and a friend and a mentor and a training partner, um, you know, using cannabis in their own right, being patients for themselves. And then as my conditions um, as a patient started to flare and flare, and become more of more of an issue. I, I, I tended to look to cannabis um, as an alternative to the first line uh, medicines like opioids, painkillers, SSRIs. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's what worked best for me. Um, and it was actually uh, during the time of 2015 when the UFC partnered with uh, the United States Anti-Doping Agency, which is, um, you know, part of the World Anti-Doping Agency and then more broadly the Olympics. Um, the UFC hired them on at that point. And that's when I found myself at a crossroads because cannabis is actually considered a banned substance in uh, competition. So it was then I, I started to do my due diligence and reached out to my family doctor who, um, again, prescribed cannabis uh, for me as both patient and athlete. And that's when I began the process of what's called a therapeutic use exemption uh, for cannabis. Um, cannabis, as I mentioned, is a prohibited substance, but you can apply for a therapeutic use of a, an exemption for specific medicines and cannabinoids are one of those. So my condition more broadly speaking is called bilateral neuropathy. It's essentially nerve damage of my upper extremities. Um, and the way to explain it is, uh, you know, I, th there's nerve endings that are kind of a little bit both shot, you know, a little bit miswired. Um, again, that doesn't actually, uh, you know, it doesn't actually uh, hinder my ability to compete, but it hinders my ability to compete at a competitive or a equal playing field because other athletes can use their medicine without any issue. Uh, like for instance, there's no issue of you um, crushing a handful of Percocets, but if I had cannabis in my system two weeks earlier, three weeks earlier, depending on your size, uh, you can get suspended, your fight overturned, half your purse taken away. And uh, you know, the stigma of being a cheater. Uh, I'm a huge believer uh, in clean sport. Um, one of the proudest moments I had as a, a UFC um, fighter was when the UFC partnered with USADA because I do believe in clean sport. Um, the only issue was, again, because USADA gets paid by uh, the United States government and the current um, stance of cannabis as a schedule one drug, they don't look at it with any medical property. So uh, me applying for my therapeutic use exemption was kind of an uphill battle, even though they um, acknowledged my um, condition, even though they acknowledged uh, that cannabis worked best for me. In my process, I had to exhaust all of their traditional, traditional medicines, first line medicines. So essentially I had to I had to essentially say, okay, cannabis works for me. And this is not just me, it's my doctor and my many doctors that I um, had to process. But cannabis is right for me. But because it's a banned or prohibited substance uh, in competition, you have to try every other drug under the sun just to come back to the point where, again, I was dealing with not necessarily the British Columbia um, Athletic Commission, but the uphill battle with the US because, again, they look at cannabis as a Schedule One drug with no medical properties. 
So I had to essentially try every single drug under the sun um, for three to nine weeks just to have it work really horrible for my body and my ability as both patient and athlete uh, during that uh, schedule in order just to say this, this drug, this traditional drug doesn't work. Now let's move on to the next one. All in hopes to eventually use my actual medicine, uh, medical cannabis, uh, to the point where my doctor would even scratch his head saying, you know, some of these, you know, uh, antidepressants or some of these SSRIs, we don't even suggest this for us anymore. So interesting. Now, I know as well, um, uh, Elias, you talked about it as well for mental health. Is, is that something that you use it for as well? Oh, definitely in the aspect of the, you know, anti-anxiety, um, you know, just overall in regards to, uh, you know, aspects of your day-to-day grind. You know, as Ross alluded to, uh, how it takes to be a professional athlete. Obviously, he's hitting the slopes. Sometimes people are hitting me. Uh, and uh, I can talk about, you know, the aspect of just the wear and tear is much more actual grueling on someone, uh, you know, me personally, from my own experience, than the actual fight, uh, where, you know, it's that day-to-day grind. And, you know, the, there's a whole aspect of both uh, body and mind that cannabis definitely helps. Um, and again, the capacity that other first-line medicines are still allowed to be used, but because of cannabis's current stigma and illegality in certain jurisdictions, looking at the U.S., looking at places in Europe, looking at other places in the world, um, that again, it up until now and more recently, it wasn't an option when it could have been an option for many, many patients and athletes. Um, as as a professional athlete yourself or a retired professional athlete, um, the uses of cannabis, but do you think that cannabis has a bigger role this year based on the pandemic and mental health um, being on the rise or mental health yeah. issues being on the rise? Do you think yeah. cannabis has a bigger role? Hey, if the Canadian government sent out an ounce of weed to every citizen in Canada, there would be an instant lockdown in place. Yeah. Everyone would just stay home. <laughs> I'm not going out. Yeah. I don't want to go out anymore. I'm just going to stay home. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think weed is very um, pandemic friendly. For one thing, you do enjoy staying home um, if you're a cannabis user and watch Netflix or get into your hobbies. Um But don't you find for mental health, it also, uh, there's been studies done around the fact that it can, it can help with mental health issues as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mental health, anxiety, um, depression, you know, if used properly, it can be super helpful. Um, You know, cannabis, uh, you know, I've I've lived in in a, a, my life since Nagano has been a lot of isolation from the real world. And especially at first getting used to um, my notoriety and, and stuff, I was very much isolated and really, and for the most part, even from the people closest to me, because their life and mine was so different. And I found that um, much like the pandemic, where you're kind of left to your own um, resources with isolation, that cannabis can be quite a good companion and can make the mundane, like cleaning your house or mowing the lawn or anything like that seem a lot more interesting, like folding laundry, for example. Uh, Great. Uh, If you're smoking weed, not so great if you're not. But, um, (laughs) you know, so there's a lot of things that, you know, take your mind off that cannabis can do to take your mind off of, you know, the day to day. And that's the way I use cannabis. I, after I, you know, the, the, the days, the weight of the day just comes right off my shoulders. Um, It's an automatic, Um, pass. I don't have to worry about, you know, it keeps me from worrying. And at the same time, it doesn't lie to you. If you do have things looming in your life that you need to deal with, um, cannabis will make you aware of that as well. And that's sometimes where people's anxiety and paranoia come from is, oh, it's making me think too much about this one thing that I've been avoiding dealing with. And And alcohol helps me not deal with it. So I'm going to keep, you know, and so weed's a, a substance that not only for psychological injuries where it, it can bring them up and make you put you in a position to sort of think about it to the point where you start to deal with it. Um, same with injuries on a physical level instead of a mental level, you can take an opiate and not even feel injured anymore and continue to injure that injury. 
by feeling healthy, basically, and not laying low. Whereas if you use cannabis properly, um, you will always feel the injury, but you will be able to live your life and work around it so that it gets better and better instead of hiding it and masking it. And so I think that's one of the, the big differences with, with cannabis is as far as athletes are concerned, especially um, is, you know, you need to be mentally and physically on, on point uh, to compete at a high level. Well, I think the one thing that's interesting about this and what I love what you guys are doing is that um, I think that there is a stereotype. Um, one of our sessions, one of our episodes that we did as part of the Cannabis Investor Series was all about cannabis culture. And there very much is a stereotype. And I think I think athletes, um, most of all, will break that stereotype because obviously um, your bodies need to be in prime um, condition. Um, and I think perhaps this view of what a cannabis user is um, doesn't meet that of, you know, an athlete that where you guys have your body kind of at the level that you do. So I think I think that'll really help with that. Um, my next question is uh, there's been a bunch of changes that have happened. Um, I'll just read through some of the changes here that are finally starting to happen within the professional organizations. Um, the NFL came out in 2019 and announced multiple new steps it was taking to better understand cannabis and its can, can, cannabinoid, <laughs> cannabinoids, <laughs> including wanting to learn about different CBD delivery systems and how products such as edibles, oils, and vaporizers could help players as potential pain management tools. So they've come out and they've said that they're going to start looking at this as an option for um, for their athletes. The NBA has come out and said, although um, although it's still banned, they're not going to test for it anymore. Um, the Major League Baseball announced that it reached an agreement with Players Association to remove cannabis, THC, and CBD from the league's list of drug and drug of abuse. Uh, so that's been removed. The NHL um, no longer classifies cannabis as a banned substance, um, but does continue to test for THC levels. And then the USC has come out um, and the United States Anti-Doping Agency announced they would no longer punish athletes who test positive for THC. These are just some of the changes that have come into play. Um, so there definitely is some movement that is happening within the professional forum. One thing I found was interesting was there's actually a soccer league based out of Las Vegas that is actually sponsored by a cannabis company. Do you think that this is something that we'll see more of Elias? Uh, why don't we start with you? Um, yeah, I definitely think uh, this will be something we'll be seeing more as more and more of the stigma and more of the, you know, both in, you know, in competition and also just in business. Um, personally, my actual last fight um, where I, uh, got my therapeutic use exemption approved and also validated where I was able to compete and went by, uh, you know, a TKO um, back in March was in British Columbia, uh, as mentioned, where the therapeutic use exemption was. But I was also, I was both fighter and promoter um, where I co-promoted uh, co the event and was actually able to uh, stream it. And uh, through there, I was able to actually event to 19 and 21 plus, depending on where your jurisdiction was. And that allowed me to actually no longer have some of the restrictions that advertising and cannabis have. And I, you know, the whole event was actually sponsored and uh, funded by cannabis sponsors. So again, I was able to not only uh, to validate my therapeutic use exemption and create precedent for not only for myself, but others, but also allow a venue and actual allow cannabis to be a, you know, integral part of the actual business model. And it's great to hear about the soccer, um, you know, the soccer um, team and company out there. Um, and hopefully, you know, this is just the beginning. Um, you know, the many different things that you mentioned uh, were, at, you know, not only is the, the organizations or the, the, the teams uh, no longer looking at cannabis as, a, you know, with this stigma, um, you know, they're looking at it as a potential answer to some of the issues that plague athletes and potentially patients. Ross, you obviously are building um, Ross's Gold and you've been building that brand for a long time. Is this something that you'd want to attach your name to, you know, as you as you go down this road and continue to build the brand, would you want to align yourself with um, with associations or with, um, you know, uh, teams or sport in general? I'm assuming snowboard might have something to do with it. Yeah, I think collaborations moving forward with the Ross Gold brand and sports organizations, um, not just in Canada, but around the world is definitely a, a, a play that we've been looking at over the years, NHL boards, 
things like that where we can really get out in front of uh, Canadians and get in front of the the users, the, the cannabis users, the people um, who uh, you know resonate you know with with uh, with cannabis and with that uh, way of way of life and the way of doing things. So having sports teams getting on board with with cannabis also speaks to you know the numbers, um, the safety of of cannabis and how there there hasn't been you know, overdoses or addictions or uh, other social issues that attach to cannabis that make it more um, corporate friendly than what, you know, the corporate world might have thought initially. And, and compared to some of the other sponsors of um, major sporting events, um, you know, you can, you can see how, how cannabis is a, is a much lighter footprint on, on society in general. Um, and Ross, what do you think the future will be? Do you think that more of this stigma will continue to get removed as jurisdictions become legal? Do you think this is something we're going to see more and more of the t- the two align, the two worlds colliding? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I, I think athletes have always been part of you know a health movement in one way or another, and cannabis has definitely been part of that movement all along from the very beginning. I mean, prohibition's only been eighty years out of thousands of years of cannabis use and. And had no reason really other than corporate greed and, and racial tensions for, for that to have happened in the first place. So, you know, for athletes to use a natural substance um, to combat a multitude of, uh, of things that an athlete would, would come across and, and just a, the average guy, the average, the average person um, uh, in a healthy way, in a natural way, in a, a renewable way. And um, we're not we're not even getting into you know some of the other industrial products that that cannabis and hemp um, can lend itself to as far, as far as pulp and paper and and the renewable potential that that the plant has. So, but as far as an athlete is concerned, um, you know, cannabis is where athletes should be gravitating towards. Uh, you know, the opioids that have been pushed on athletes, and and let me just uh, you know. I, I know Elias mentioned that, you know, I hit the slopes and sometimes his opponents hit him. That's the difference. But I'll tell you what, buddy, the slopes can hit back pretty hard. Oh, at heck yes. Miles an hour. I don't heck know if yes. you've seen any ragdoll events uh, out there in the, in the downhill world, but, um, you know, you can finish a day off of training after having had uh, multiple crashes. And, you know, it's those wins where you don't see the crash uh, on, on TV that, you um, you know, you walk away with, uh, with pride, but lots of, lots of days of, of pain and suffering out there, but, but also passion. And, um, at the end of the day, I think, you know, people have, have passion, you know, for life. And I think, um, that relates to, you know, the way cannabis works. You know, it's interesting in all the interviews that we've done as part of this cannabis investor series, the one word that comes up in almost every single interview is the word passion. Elias, what do you think, um, what do you think the future of cannabis and professional sport is? Um, Just growing, uh, both uh, metaphorically speaking and in general, uh, the aspect of, you know, as more and more jurisdictions continue to uh, either outright remove it or, you know, just in general, don't uh, penalize people for it and looking at, at it as for what it is, plant-based medicine. And, uh, you know, Ross talked about it in the capacity of, um, you know, the, the stigma and the illegality through prohibition and then where that, you know, injustice kind of came from. And, you know, trying to just make up in all that lost time, both, um, you know, on the medical side and, you know, the opportunity for patients to reintroduce themselves or introduce themselves more broadly to cannabis for both its medical and medicinal purposes, and then business as well, uh, looking at it as a, an opportunity to, um, you know, be a part of, uh, um, you know, the aspect of, you know, what sports are both um, in the, you know, the sense of the competition, but also, again, the the, the profitable and, you know, um, you know, the aspect of it, it being big business. It's going to be really big, especially with concussions and prevention of concussion and recovery of concussions, but like NFL players and things like that. Um, the whole opioid crisis is really bringing it to a, a head where um, athletes are going to be able to choose cannabis. For example, the Olympics, we're going to see them. They, they lifted CBD off the list of banned substances. So you're allowed to have CBD as an Olympic athlete. Soon THC will also be lifted. 
and you will see dispensaries and and um, um, areas at the Olympics where you can consume cannabis, just like there is a beer garden at the Olympics uh, for the athletes in Athletes Village. So um, we're going to see a, a level playing field here when it comes to natural versus pharmaceutical um, and how athletes are taken care of as people. Wonderful. Well, listen, I can't thank you both enough for your participation in this. Thank you again for all the work that you're doing, um, the advocacy work that you both do, as well as just breaking, I think, the stigma around it. I think what you both brought up that's really important is, um, you know, some of the addiction that comes along with the opioids that are being handed out to athletes. Um, and there's a lot of benefits that this can provide um, to a community that spends so much time taking care of their bodies. And it's it's a natural source. So um, thank you very much for what you both do. And uh, please come join us again. Sounds like fun. Yeah, no. So look, I mean, uh, there's a lot to discuss in that session, um, but I got to get your hot take on the uh, Ross Rigliotti, um one ounce per Canadian citizen proposal for for maybe not this pandemic, but if we have another one. What do, do we agree with that? It's like the chicken in every pot. Uh, it's the pot in every chicken or something. I mean, look, nobody's ever going to send an ounce to every Canadian home. But if they did, I think Ross might be right. People would probably like doing their laundry a lot more. Um, but I do like, I like, I mean, I've talked about those guys on our program. I think they're uh, both tremendous athletes, of course, but also mm -hmm. strong advocates and actually from different perspectives, wildly different perspectives, I think. Um, but also, you know, I follow Ross on Instagram and, um, you know, he lives it. He's not, he's not messing around. Like this is his life. This is his lifestyle. Uh, the Olympics were like part of it, but much more than that, this is sort of the life he lives. And, um, you know, if anybody embodies sort of the West Coast uh, athlete, sort of snowboarder vibe it's him oh thousand percent no and, and elias is another character he's he's been on survivor man he was on uh uh he's starting to do some acting i mean he's he's all over the place so it's um it, these guys are are not just uh sitting around smoking yeah. pot um well, or or using the creams or whatever they're doing but yeah i'd rather get hit by the slope i'd rather hit the slope than uh, than someone who elias fights getting hitting me or having elias hit me he's 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 a bad, a bad, bad man. He's a bad mofo. Yeah. No, there's some good photos on uh, on Google Images if you want to see uh, the, <laughs> see some of his work. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just want to give a shout out uh, again. If you're watching on Airme today, thank you for registering. So one of the benefits is we're in there right now. We're chatting. I know Barrington, Miller, Philip Shum, Anil Mall, uh, even Richard Carlton, I think, is in there watching and uh, chatting with the citizens and. Uh, Thanks again for being a part of the community, uh, both at the CSE, but Business of Cannabis, and just in cannabis uh, industry in, in general. I just going through this process of providing this content, just really feeling a lot closer, or at least appreciating where the CSE uh, fits in the cannabis world. And, uh, you know, we have a lot to thank, uh, thank for out of the industry. And um, so, yeah, just uh, thank you for being participants today. Still have a lot of great content coming up, and we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, we've got... Uh, a brief series of issuer pitches. So obviously the Canadian Securities Exchange is home to a multitude of uh, cannabis issuers, cannabis companies. And this week we're focusing on the medical space. So uh, we've got several companies that are pitching, uh, if you will, their medical uh, scenarios with the cannabis. And uh, without further ado, I will play that right now for you. Hi, I'm Jen Drake, co-COO of Air Wellness. Air Wellness is an expanding, vertically integrated U.S. multi-state cannabis operator, currently in seven key states, focused on delivering the highest quality cannabis products and customer experience throughout our footprint. At Air, we're guided by a belief that cannabis can be a force for good, improving lives, promoting wellness, inspiring wonder, and contributing to strong, socially responsible communities. AIR stands for quality cannabis cultivation, an excellent in-store customer experience, a wide range of brands to drive customer choice, and a deep-rooted commitment to our local communities. Over the last three years, we've built AIR to a seven-state MSO with operations in Massachusetts, Nevada, 
Arizona, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New Jersey, and Florida. Our footprint covers a population of nearly 73 million people, and four of our seven states are approved for adult use today. Our focus since day one has been to be in the states that matter, where we can earn extraordinary returns on capital for our shareholders. We're in limited licensed states with large markets and strong cannabis programs that have allowed us to earn those extraordinary returns on capital. Our assets are some of the most profitable and productive in the space with MSO leading EBITDA and free cash flow margins, store productivity levels that lead the industry and cultivation yields at the top of industry standards. We've invested in strong business systems to ensure best practices in terms of operating, reporting and compliance. And those systems have allowed us to efficiently and effectively integrate new states as we continue to grow our footprint and add to our team of over 1,500 employees. At AIR, we believe quality begins with the plant, and we continue to demonstrate that by investing resources in our state-of-the-art cultivation facilities and in our team. That quality then carries through every part of our organization with quality brands, retail stores, in-store experience, and community engagement. Accelerating regulatory changes at both the federal and state levels mean that mainstreaming of cannabis in the US will accelerate as well. We have positioned AIR to be a leader in that transition with strong operational and financial foundations, but as importantly, with the mission to deliver wellness and wonder of cannabis. Hello everyone, I am Iftah Ben Yaakov, I'm from Israel, and I'm the COO of Beyond Canasoft Enterprises, which lately been listed in the CSE uh, in Canada. We are a software, a CRM software company in the big data. Uh, in the past 12 months, a very unique program uh, to the medical cannabis world that will uh, make all the chain in the medical cannabis world, uh, life's much easier. Uh, dealing with big data is a big problem for everyone, of course, and we are trying to solve some of the problems, mainly and especially all the, grow, all the grown farms uh, of medical cannabis that needs a lot of uh, data to be consolidated. And uh, this is what we're working on right now. Uh, our company uh, also um, joined a private company in Israel that calls BB Investments. And this company has a license to grow and manufacture medical cannabis in Israel. Uh, we decided that we will build uh, an indoor farm of medical cannabis in order that we can do all the pilots for the software in the farm and also to uh, have some revenue from this business and build uh, manufacturers of medical cannabis uh, in Israel. So thank you for listening and bye-bye. There are 36 states in the U.S. that have made medical marijuana legal, with four more states expected to vote on legalization in the next 12 months. Cannabis as a medicine isn't new, but now it's on a hockey stick trajectory. With the global medical marijuana market expected to grow at approximately 22.9% compound annual growth rate until it reaches U.S. $44.4 billion by 2025. Cantab Therapeutics, Pill.C, is leading the charge in this nascent market with the development of strong IP in terms of therapeutic cannabis formulations and drug delivery methods. Until recently, THC-based therapeutics were smoked, eaten, or drank, none of which provided consistent dosing or bioavailability. Doctors were desperate for a lab-quality answer. So CanTab came up with it by extracting the medicinal compounds found in cannabis and pressing them into pills, ensuring accurate dosage and distribution throughout the body. CanTab utilizes a four-pronged revenue model based on licensing, hard pill product sales, manufacturing profit, and online store sales starting in Q2 2021. The company's IP portfolio contains one U.S. patent and its first Canadian patent even wider than the U.S. one, both of which remain active until 2038, and also eight more pending patents 
for proprietary processes and hard pill formulations. Focusing on the opioid crisis, which killed one Canadian for every two hours in 2018, CanTab will conduct a clinical study in 2021 with leading orthopedic surgeon Dr. Donald Garbuz at UBC to show the potential for reduction in the use of opiates in post-operative pain care using CanTab's modified multi-release formulation with high CBD and low THC. The company intends to use these efforts to obtain a cannabis drug establishment license with clinical support and then drug identification numbers for CanTab's product pipeline. With expert management, a tight 44 million shares, two patents for immediate release cannabidiol formulation tablets, and three pill products including an oral dissolving pill, an instant release pill, and an extended release pill due to be marketed by the end of 2021, CanTab is poised to be an industry leader with a significant market cap growth for its investors. Hi, my name is Iris Binkovic and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Inocan Pharma. Inocan is listed on the CSC under INNO and it is composed of three different divisions. The first one, we are the, I think the only company as far as I know in the world who does injectable cannabinoids. We already initiated cl two clinical trials to demonstrate the efficacy that one injection replaces daily consumptions of up to three weeks. So instead of taking daily, you would have one injection. Uh, we did uh, this uh, in two different uh, mechanisms. The second thing Inocan is involved is exosomes, which are bypass of stem cells in order to treat uh, COVID-19 defected lungs. Uh, we embedded uh, the exosome with the CBD and targeted the, the defected lungs of the COVID-19. And the third area we are active in is developing unique patent pending topicals we have finalized the first production. We, this year, we launched the B2C cell platforms, which are already active. And this is just scratching the surface of uh, Inocan potential. In this year, regarding the uh, patent site, we have uh, applied for six patent applications in all our area we are working on. It's all about synergy between science, years of science, knowledge, and the combine of uh, CBD therapeutic benefits. We try to validate what we develop, in, either it's by our patent pending uh, pain relief product, which we actually did a clinical trial in New York to validate. And after 20 minutes, 83% of participants noticed immediate relief in pain if it's in our topical, which after one month's application, you see wrinkle reduction of 20, 90 to 95% or increased hydration after using our topical. So Inocan brings vast knowledge in pharmaceutical into the new cannabinoid area, backed by science, proven by uh, validated studies, and this is the, the essence uh, of Inocan. And again, you can find us on the CSC under INNO. Hi, Doug Klopek here, CEO and founder of Juva Life. Juva is a publicly traded company, proudly trading on the Canadian Securities Exchange under this ticker JUVA, and in the United States on the OTC market under JUVAF. Juva is a vertically integrated life science cannabis company. We utilize uh, well over a decade of experience cultivating, manufacturing, distributing, and direct-to-consumer retail selling cannabis products to create an infrastructure and supply chain that allows us to really focus on our true model, which is new drug development and discovery for targeted ailments in the human body using Western IRB approved patient research registry protocols to validate our chemistry and science that we know anecdotally for dozens of years in the retail space, 
and what we've seen in university and clinical models. We are now applying the rigor of the FDA approved processes to cannabis to truly unlock the mystery of how does it work? Who does it work for? Why does it work? And how can we repeat that using validated clinical measures? Our targets are really small molecule inflammation. As inflammation is really the root of most ailments affecting society globally. So over the next coming year to year and a half, we hope to have a number of very huge uh, milestones that will progress towards our overall goal of creating new therapeutics with proven effects for afflictions that are troubling to the human society at large. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Rahul Kashwa, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Predict Medics. We are trading on the CSC under the symbol PMED. We are an artificial intelligence company which is developing solutions that solve real world problems. Our target is uh, workplace health and safety along with healthcare. We have developed a technology which without the use of any biological agents works using multispectral imaging and a host of sensors with our proprietary artificial intelligence to identify cannabis and alcohol impairment. Um, at the same time, uh, we have also developed a solution that can screen for symptoms of infectious diseases like COVID-19. And we are also developing a solution that can screen for uh, mental health uh, associated issues. Uh, right now, as we speak, our infectious disease solution has been deployed in several parts of the world with some major success stories, which has been covered by media. And we are in a full commercialization phase with contracts uh, that we have announced and that are to be announced. As far as the impairment solution goes, we have initiated some major pilots, which we have announced previously, and we are moving full steam ahead with commercialization. We are focused on organic growth, but at the same time, uh, we have announced certain strategic acquisitions that can potentiate us, potentiate our growth and take us to the next level. So uh, uh, we are focused on long-term growth and our focus is to become the leaders in the space of AI, how it pertains to workplace health and safety and healthcare. Our team includes engineers, clinicians, key opinion leaders from different fields of healthcare. And at the same time, our advisory board is led by Mr. Kapil Ravel, who is the uh, director of AI at Microsoft. Uh, feel free to check out our website, www.predictmedics.com. That's P-R-E-D-I-C-T-M-E-D-I-X.com for more information. Thank you. Hi, guys. This is Robert Galarza, CEO, True Trace Technologies. Uh, really coming to you today, really talk about what we are up to. At TrueTrace, we have developed the very first blockchain secure traceability solution, really connecting the detail and granular uh, elements of cannabis at a batch lot level. And every, that incorporates everything from genetics to deeper cannabinoid understanding, terpenes, documentation, everything that associates a product uh, back to its, its lineage and the provenance all the way through to uh, distribution. We work with a number of different operators in the space, both in Canada and the United States. And we've actually been fortunate enough to even work with Shoppers Drug Mart up in Canada on a medical initiative, really focused on making sure we can make cannabis a specific, specified medicine for patients long-term and really getting to the point where they can look at the products they've been taking over a historical period of time and understand why they may be affecting them within a particular way. Uh, we are fully cloud-based solutions, so we're incredibly dynamic and nimble. We're uh, open and collaborative in the sense that our manufacturers and production partners have the ability to communicate with both their distributors, uh, buyers, and retailers down line through our system, um, as well as being able to secure the information within their own infrastructure for things like recalls, auditability, audit trails, things of that nature. So been an extremely exciting couple of years in the space. Uh, we cut our teeth in Canada. Uh, very excited about what we're seeing unfold here in the US now. We have been uh, hard at work at uh, making sure we're preparing for whatever the legal landscape ends up being uh, here in the US whether that ends up being uh, medical or recreational, we're definitely ready for it, ready to tackle it. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to do great things uh, in Canada and down here in the US. Hi, my name is Hugh Rogers. I'm the CEO of Xphyto Therapeutics Corp. Xphyto trades on the CSC under the symbol XPHY. We are a diversified bioscience accelerator focused on high growth investment opportunities with the potential for meaningful human impact. 
X-Fighting, X-Fido's leading life science investments include pathogen diagnostics, neurological drug formulations, and psychedelic medicine. With our drug formulation product pipeline, are several exciting cannabinoid-based oral dissolvable drug products entering human trials in Europe this year. These three sublingual dissolvable medical formulas include a CBD, a THC, and a one-to-one -one CBD THC product for epilepsy, nausea and anorexia, and multiple sclerosis, respectively. Exphyto has just recently received European commercial approval for its rapid point-of-care COVID-19 PCR system with several additional diagnostic products expected in the market later this year. With a strong portfolio of medical diagnostics, drug formulations, as well as a rapidly growing psychedelic medicine business focused on industrial scale production of pharmaceutical grade psychedelic compounds, Exphyto is well positioned to take advantage of major trends in the life science industry. For more information, please visit our website at www.exphyto.com, xphyto.com, or email us at info at xphyto.com. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. Perfect. Having fun. I'm, I'm having a great time. Um, thanks everyone for watching that. That was uh, those were issuer pitches. Every one of those companies is listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange. You can go to our website, thecse.com. Uh, you can look up stocks. You can look uh, quotes. You can look up uh, <laughs> regulatory documents if you please. Um, get to learn the companies more, and uh, perhaps you're already an investor in one of these. It's uh, or a few of them. But yeah. Um, we're going to take a tonal shift now for the remainder of this program. And uh, I talked to Jay behind the scenes here. And, and what we're doing is uh, we are going to talk about social equity and justice. And these are topics that have been undercurrents throughout the entire series thus far. And uh, maybe Jay, if you want to just uh, tell me from your own perspective, um, you know, where you've intersected with social justice and equity um, in the cannabis sector, if there's places that you've seen changes or at least been encouraged by the evolution of the industry and how the impact of it on people who have been disadvantaged by the uh, persecution that has come through this industry. Um, anything that you've seen that's given you, you know, some hope? Um, yes, but very little of it is actually in Canada. I mean, in Canada, yeah. you know, it's open to expungements and, and pardons, um, but very, very few people have taken advantage of that. And I think that's uh, complexity and, and cost is my guess. Um, that's on, that's, that's here on this side of the border. In, uh, on the other side of the border, I, I think I'm even a, a little bit more encouraged uh, from a couple of reasons. One, many states, especially ones that are legalizing now, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and others, are making this actually part or pillar of their legalization plans, um, both in terms of equity, in terms of licensing, but also in terms of expungement and, and, um, and pardons. And so uh, you look at sort of New York's history and legalization, which is now coming to the fore, it was delayed in many respects in part because of this pillar, which was not enough. Uh, same thing in New Jersey. I think we'll see it in more and more states. So in that respect, like it, it's great because it's actually much more on the floor of the conversation than certainly it has been on the Canadian front. At the same time, the the um, the inequity has been far greater there, right? Just in terms of, terms of uh, black and brown people um, and people of color in, in prison related to cannabis is just through the roof. And so they have a long way to go. It's how to balance that that equity and provide access to capital to those people that want to actually enter the space. It is a very challenging business to be in. We know that that's sort of the, and so to do it is really challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And so how, how to do it, how to do it right. Each state sort of has their own view on it. We've seen some movement in Illinois, certainly in New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts and others. And so I think we'll see, it's not a, it's not a near term solve. It is more of a long-term thing. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll look at this with the lens of a year, two and five, as opposed to two, three months. And so I think we'll see there, but, but I think it is much more the for the conversation in states coming online now versus mm -hmm. states that, that went before. And, and certainly then it's been, I mean, we rarely ever talk about it here in Canada. No, no. Well, let's use this as a forum then to do that. So uh, we've got two great conversations. Uh, we have Steve D'Angelo talking about the last prisoner project. Um, but before that, we have Barrington Miller, CSE's own Barrington Miller, leading a discussion on uh, social justice, social equity, and the cannabis industry with uh, three wonderful women who um, have had a lot of experience in their own right in the space. So without further ado, I'll roll tape. Please enjoy and comment. Comment within the group if you hear something that uh, you want to discuss. They're an air meet 
or across any of the social channels that this is being broadcast on. Hi, welcome to the Cannabis Investor Series. I'm your host, Barrington Miller. And today we are talking about social equity. What is social equity? What does it mean? And how does it relate to the cannabis industry? I have Ashley, Jamie, and Emma talk about where they're from. Ashley, thank you for coming. And tell us a little bit about what you do and where you're coming from. My name is Ashley Affel. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Harvester Cannabis. Uh, we are a craft cultivation facility in, located in Ontario. And we are actually the very first 100% Black-owned cultivation and processing facility in Canada. So we are super excited with this title, but we are also very aware of the responsibility that that holds. So um, we are excited to be here. We're excited to be licensed and I'm excited to have this conversation with you guys finally. Oh, thank you so much. And we're happy to have you, Ashley. Jamie Pearson, CEO of Bang. You might know Bang from trading on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Uh, go ahead, Jamie. Hi, uh, I'm Jamie Pearson, the president and CEO of Bang Corporation. We are one of the oldest brands and legal brands in cannabis. We were born in Oakland 10 years ago or 11 years ago, excuse me. Uh, we're now in seven U.S. states and we're one of the top three SKUs in Canada. Um, and our CBD products are distributed throughout the United States and in nine European countries. Um, happy to be here. And social equity is a conversation that is uh, something, uh, I would say, the drum that Bang has been beating for years. And so uh, definitely think it's an important topic in cannabis. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, last but not least, Emma Andrews. Go ahead, Emma. Hi, everyone. So my name is Emma Andrews. I'm hailing from Vancouver, Canada, and I'm the director of marketing with Nextleaf Solutions, uh, which is the world's most innovative cannabis processor based in Port Coquitlam, uh, most innovative by way of the number of patents that we hold for the extraction, refinement and purification of cannabinoid based ingredients. And traditionally, we've been a B2B ingredient supplier and pivoting now also into the B2C space, uh, which I'm really excited about. I have a background in consumer packaged goods and the natural food industry. Um, and I'm really excited to be sharing a little bit more behind the scenes with our company in terms of female leadership. Um, I am a working mom. My daughter is just 18 months old. And gratefully, I've been able to work through my mat leave, if you will, a really non-traditional mat leave, um, and continue my work in the cannabis industry. And as I'm sure all these ladies can share, a rolling stone gathers no moss. And um, I've been really grateful to have a sound landing with Nextleaf and be able to marry both of those parts of my personality, the career side and the, uh, the mom side. Well, thank you. And, uh, for our audience and listeners, it was just a coincidence, um, that we have three females on, or maybe it isn't a coincidence. Maybe, uh, this is being led, um, being led by, by this, um, this great gathering. So let's, let's jump into it. What is social equity? Uh, Ashley, what is social equity to you? And tell us your definition. Yeah, there's, there's so many facets of social equity to me personally. Uh, just a little background. I was brought up in Scarborough, Ontario, from two Caribbean parents. And my Caribbean parents, being immigrants in this uh, country, uh, really kind of allowed me to well, first of all, where I lived allowed me to see some of the challenges that people from our community have to deal with. And as well, uh, working in the business, in business and corporate spaces, I was also able to see some of the challenges that we also face. So when it comes to social equity, I feel like there's two lanes. There could be more, but there's two lanes that I see. And that is just the essential like justice and fairness of society and how people are tr being treated um, uh, within society. And there's also the social justice equity piece of where those communities and how they're flourishing and how those businesses are flourishing. So there's different segments to social justice, um, but you know, I'm happy as well. I'm here to have that conversation with all of you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jamie, you've been a very outspoken proponent for it. And 
you know, you have that, you have the United States perspective, uh, which might be different than, than we're experiencing in Canada. Um, what does social equity mean to you? One of the things I talk about when I'm out speaking is the fact that we're in prohibition in cannabis, which means that the industry doesn't really fully exist yet in its um, capa- in the capacity that it can be once we have banking and uh, federal legalization and we're able to uh, make products in one place and you know send them everywhere else. But what that also means is we have an opportunity to right some of the wrongs. Um, And what we have in America is really an undeniable targeting of black and brown people using cannabis as a way to put them in prison. And so what we have right now is an industry where we've got companies making millions and millions of dollars while we have 30,000 black and brown people sitting in prison in prison at taxpayers' expense for the very same behavior that we're allowing other people to make millions of dollars in. And what I think is that that's egregious. And I think we have to uh, understand that our industry was built on the backs of these people who were making, first of all, taking risks to make the plant available because it makes people feel better. And let's be honest that cannabis is a wellness product. And it's, I always say it's a gateway drug to wellness. Uh, wellness for our communities, wellness for our bodies, and wellness for our emotions and our um, our spirits. And so we have this population of people that made cannabis available. It was available. It was being used for millennia. And then we had this um, targeted effort. And what I think is that it was targeted by pharmaceutical companies, alcohol companies, and what we have to do now is right the wrongs of the past. And so to me, that's what equity is. Equality is where you give everyone Mm -hmm. equal access to resources and equity is where you actually distribute the resources according to where they're needed. We need to make sure that um, the, the communities that were targeted and that were really impacted the most by the quote unquote war on drugs, that they have access to licensure, business ownership opportunities, and employment opportunities. And what I think is that it's time for us as a nation to really look at the framework of business, not just in cannabis, but overall, and look at things like 85% of all business decisions, uh, excuse me, purchasing decisions are made by women in the household. What I think needs to happen is that we need to be looking at the framework of business through the lens of the cannabis industry because we have the opportunity in our industry right now to make some of these changes that are, it's not just about, you know, being a tree hugging feminist liberal. It isn't about that. It isn't about just the social equity, moral um, conversation. It's also about profit. And as the CEO of a public company, my job is to deliver profit to my shareholders. And when you look at the statistics, the companies that have diversity and leadership have 33% higher EBITDA across the board. That tells me if I'm not doing that, I'm committing malpractice and I can be held accountable for that. So what has to happen is we have to start looking at this as a business decision because it's not only the right thing to do from a moral perspective, it's the right thing to do from a business management perspective. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Jamie. Uh, there's a lot to take in there and I can't wait to to <laughs> sink our teeth further into it. Um, Emma, what does social equity mean to you? Yeah, before I dive in, I just want to acknowledge the differentiation that Jamie just made between equity and equality. I thought that was really poignant to share. So thanks for addressing that. Um, for me, the the facets that I look at it through is a little bit through a marketing lens, I'll be honest, is the quant and qual side of the equation. And what I mean by that is it's easy to hone in on the policies and the institutions and look at creating measurable frameworks that we can work towards in terms of improving um, social equity. But for me, the people side of it is really where I'm passionate and where I've been really um, pleased to see progress made at Next Leaf is in terms of representation. So for us, social equity means that there's representation across all layers of the organization, 
both in terms of how we recruit individuals, how we develop them, and how we place them into positions of leadership. So acknowledging whether that's board members, whether that's our leadership team, um, all the way through entry-level positions and processing positions in our lab. Um, so for me, it's about representation and ensuring that people feel like there's a seat for them at the table and a place for their voice to be heard, um, that their opinions matter, and that there's a growth uh, pathway and a succession pathway for them. Um, thank you. And thank you all three for uh, getting into it. Well, one of the common threads that I was listening to and I heard from the three of you is it's not an immediate thing. It's not it's not attacking the problem uh, at the surface. It's going back and going way, way back further and deeper and, um, you know, rearranging the mechanics of a systemic system that is clearly uh, not broken. It's working exactly how it was designed to work, um, but it's changing that system. And uh, to that, I, I kind of want to turn it over to to Ashley because she is involved in working at uh, changing, you know, the pen is mighty than the sword. And um, I'm going to let her tell uh, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, Ashley, thanks. over to you. Thanks, Barrington. Um, essentially, Getting licensed, we got licensed in October 9th, 2020. And, you know, to our surprise, Health Canada reached out to us to ask us how they can include more diversity inclusion into the space. And we decided to really take a step back and really think about how this could be done. So, you know, in previous ways, you know, our, our strategy would normally be, you know, let's bring in community, let's have a community conversation. And we still want to implement that. But what we really want to target and what we really want to focus on is the policies. And changing policy will essentially allow for a change in trajectory. So up here in Canada, back in November 2020, Justin Trudeau released a program and it was called the Black Entrepreneurship Program. The purpose of this program was to ensure that Black entrepreneurs and Black persons of color I guess you could say like myself, would have the opportunity to actually build business uh, and as well get funded. So with this opportunity, it's still rolling out to let you know, uh, with this opportunity being generated, I just thought it would be perfect if we could implement the licensing structure from Health Canada, specifically the, the already established Indigenous structure uh, to be placed and merged into the Black Entrepreneurship Program. So just to give you a little bit of background on what's happening with the Indigenous Navigator Program, which has already been established and quite successful, uh, the Indigenous Navigator Program, just one of the points of it is that one could essentially get uh, licensed before their whole facility is built out. And Health Canada would be helping them every single step of the way to get to where they need to be. And I thought that would be a really great merger with the Black Entrepreneurship Program. And I love the fact that you're using a framework um, that's already been established. You're going to the government and saying, you already put it down. You already have it out. Yeah. We're taking that and we're, <laughs> you're not giving them an out, which is, which is great. Um, Emma, you're coming more from the, from the marketing side. Uh, how would, how are you approaching it or how are you going to approach it when it comes to addressing the social equity and social equality and social justice, all, all of those things, uh, more from a media and marketing lens? Totally. I think one of the things to be really cognizant of is tokenism. Um, and especially as a publicly traded company, there's a lot of... Um, visibility on the company in terms of how you represent or who represents the company. And so to be really sure that we are authentic in how we make decisions about um, who's given a platform or uh, positions um, within the company. So um, authenticity in our hiring and in our people development, I would say, is one of the ways that we're really um, ensuring that it doesn't dance that line um, uh, towards tokenism. Um, I think within our company, we're a startup and essentially in the cannabis space, a lot of companies are since the uh, inception of the Cannabis Act. We've been in existence for about three years now um, and publicly traded for the last two. So 
there's a period of rapid growth where we both need to ensure we're hiring the right individuals, but that we're also creating um, a succession plan for um, a broader diversity of individuals to, to come into the company. Being science and technology based, uh, this tends to be male dominated industries. And so one of the ways that we've really championed this is with female leadership and then uh, additionally looking for uh, representation across uh, uh, multiple um, races and ages as well within the company. Um, we're very proud to have a woman of color on our board, um, prior Health Canada employee who has uh, spearheaded her own cannabis consulting uh, company. That's Dr. Sherry Boudram, um, a great dear friend and colleague of mine who's now also become a new mother. So there's a lot of um, female leadership in our company who have the expertise um, to deserve that spot at the table who are also living and breathing the great balancing act, um, as well as uh, dedicated to their careers. So I think, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that the people development side has been uh, truly important to us and um, championing that within science and technology, and then furthermore within the, the cannabis space. New York, is, New York is coming on, New York is legal. And this is massive. All eyes uh, in the cannabis industry are squarely focused on this, uh, that part of the universe, what is the most important thing that New York has to show in its involvement for social equity to help it spread across across the country and, you know, touch on the world? Most important is a tough question because there's so many yeah. uh, facets of that issue. But I, I personally think the the best thing that New York could do right now is lower the, the barrier to entry into the market and uh, welcome people from the illicit market. They've got the largest illicit market in the world. There's statistics anywhere from 40 metric tons to 200 metric tons of cannabis flow through the five boroughs of New York. And, you know, we know that a lot of that cannabis is coming out of California. So we know that the way New York legislates cannabis is going to have an impact um, on California as well. What I think though, is that they have a framework right now for cigarettes and alcohol distribution, and they don't need to reinvent the wheel. But what, what I envision is um, kind of learning from, you know, the mess that California made when they went wreck was basically, they said, all right, well, um, there's 3000 dispensaries in California. We're going to um, allow you guys to go wreck. We're going to give you the first crack at it, but it's going to cost you about a million bucks to get that license. Well, then what happened overnight on December 31st, you have 3000 quote unquote gray area legal dispensaries. And on January 1st, there were 300, but there were still 3000 dispensaries because the other 2,700 didn't close their doors. And they didn't fund enforcement, thankfully, because they just created 2,700 new criminals who were running illegal cannabis operations because they didn't have a million dollars to uh, apply for the licenses. What they should have done is allowed all 3,000 in, grandfathered them in, and said, you're already functioning. And what we're going to charge you is some nominal fee, maybe 10 grand or 20,000 bucks or something to convert that license from um, medical to recreational. And now all of a sudden you've got 3000 licensed dispensaries that are already operating. You can tax that, uh, product and you essentially, uh, quash the illicit market because right now in California, if you purchase cannabis on the illicit market, it's not lab tested and it's not taxed. So it's quite a bit cheaper. So obviously I'd rather have lab tested, um, cannabis and the taxation dollars, you know, do things like build schools and fix roads and all of that. So I think New York can learn from that and say, if we allow cannabis to be in every bodega that currently sells tobacco and alcohol, and we charge them a no <clears throat> nominal fee, but we allow cannabis to be sold everywhere, we lower that barrier of entry, it will um, automatically include all of the people that are currently um you know, operating those small mom and pop businesses in all of the neighborhoods that exist in all five of those uh, boroughs in New York and, and throughout New York state. And then it gives them access to the data of how big their market actually is. And 
um, there's another, you know, there's a layer of, of money that comes in from that permitting of being able to sell the cannabis and then also taxing it at the register. And it doesn't have to be this egregiously high tax so that um, the person that's going to their plug on the street corner now goes to their bodega on the street corner. And you can, you know, then allow home grow, which New York did, which I think is going to allow, you know, lowering that barrier to entry. So I think it really just boils down to giving access in a common sense way. Right now, the New York laws, I think it's funny. So they've decriminalized the possession and use of cannabis, but selling is heavily regulated. So where do they think the cannabis comes from? Is like falls out of the sky into your lap. Uh, You know what I'm saying? So I think ultimately if they want to protect the consumer, they have some heavy regulation like they do in tobacco and alcohol around the manufacturing and around the cultivation so that we know that there's no pesticides being used, that there is lab testing and um, but they make it accessible to the people that are already using it. Oh, that's a, that's a brilliant answer. Uh, Ashley, I want to ask some of the, or maybe you don't, uh, do you feel any pressure for being uh, a black owned black operating business? Is there, is there something that non BIPOC people um, don't realize? Yeah. Let's just, yeah. Just give us your perspective on the other end of, uh, of this discussion. Um, so just a little background on me. I've been in this space for a long time, but at least legally, uh, for 10 years. And, you know, you know, I've, I've maneuvered in the legal space a bit and I could understand where your question comes from. Where is there pressure? There's no actual pressure, or maybe I just don't like see it as pressure. I more so see it as a duty. It is my duty to do this. And I think it's also important that it is something that, uh, especially the opportunity that I have with Health Canada is done with, you know, uh, care and, and we're doing it properly to ensure that not even just the black community, but as well the indigenous, Asian community, South Asian community are also intertwined into this potential cannabis equity rollout. And something like this can't be rushed. You know, something like this has to, and and I understand like people want to get on board and whatnot, but something like this, we have to actually ensure that people are, people are being acknowledged, their cultures are being acknowledged and their needs are being acknowledged. And so if that means that we have to take time, if that means that we have to ensure that people are being consulted and doing it right, then sure, no problem. I don't really look at that as pressure. I look at it as an opportunity just to make a big change. So this is not even just, this is not pressure. This is like an honor for me. So I'm grateful. Yeah. I don't want black owned businesses to be a thing. It's just businesses and everybody's, everybody's owning and and all of that. So um, yeah, thank you. And you know what, when I say pressure, because, and I'm, I'm related to my own uh, background. Uh, My, my parents are Jamaican and you know, it was always, you have to do more to just get to the start line. You have to, um, and don't screw up because all eyes are really on you because you're in this position. So, um, yeah, we're, we're running different races and, uh, that's, that's just a fact. And so I, you know, kudos to you again, um, for not only thinking of this generation, but the next generation and, and so on yeah. and so on. And yeah. If you don't mind, I just wanted to, no, no. This is... as well, with regards to New York, I really like the fact that, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, individuals who actually obtain the first 25 equity licenses actually have to hold on to them for two to five years. I think that's very important. And the reason why is because what we're seeing in California and other places is that an individual person of color, a black person might be able to obtain that license, but right after would be, um, you know, 
sold, it would have to sell it to somebody who's willing to give them a pretty solid amount of money. And, you know, the idea of equity, the idea of ownership is to ensure that it at least has it for a certain period of time so it can impact that community generationally. Now, I understand everybody has the right to sell and buy as they choose, um, but I think that's a really good um, policy that's really good to ensure that individuals are not even just learning how to build a business, not executing their business, but have the ability to hold on to those businesses. Oh, that's a, that's a good point, and we can relate to that when companies go public. Um, the, uh, the owners and founders aren't, uh, able to sell their shares right away because we want to encourage investors and for the company to grow. So, uh, Emma, uh, I'd like to now turn it towards you and what's going on in Vancouver and on the West coast, because I'm, I'm in Ontario and it's different. Ontario's completely different than BC. As far as the as far as what you would like to see, um, things that are working, things that aren't working, what are some of the things that you would want to see? I personally would love to see more discerning investors um, in companies asking the questions of uh, the senior leadership and of the C-suite that there is accountability for um, their internal teams and commitments to the longevity of what we're talking about here. And I think that was such a poignant point that Ashley brought up is just the longevity of, of the decisions that get put in place or the questions that get asked. So if our investors put more pressure, and I'm speaking widely on the industry, not just for our company, but if investors and shareholders, public market or private investment um, we're demanding more commitments from companies, not just for the, the optics of corporate social responsibility, but actually putting policies into place to um, recruit and develop um, a wider breadth of representation. I think that takes an investor who is wise to the understanding that diversity equals profitability and diversity equals innovation. So if they were smart, then that would be a metric that they look to invest um, in companies. And I think um, being in Vancouver, it is certainly a, a, a hot spot, I would say, for the, the Asian American community. So there's an abundance of opportunities to um, hire from different populations to ensure that that representation exists across the, the organization. Um, whether that's here in Vancouver, downtown, or throughout Metro Vancouver. So um, it, it's not just the internal company culture, but I think that that pressure, good pressure from investors and shareholders can help to affect change as well. Oh, I, I think that's such a such an important point. Um, we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, power of the people. And, you know, we are the ones that can help decide the, the next direction. Are there are there any final thoughts, anything that I may have missed that uh, that, that you'd like to share? I just want to say when it comes to social equity, yes, we all understand the importance of it. Like we've been uh, bombarded by this message. Um, but now I just feel like it's a great time and opportunity to actually execute on it, to actually come together as industries, whether it be, you know, uh, our industry, whether it be in Canada, in the States, actually coming together so we can actually build a format, a framework for the rest of the world to look at and say, you know what, it works successfully over there. It can work over here. And that's the thing about cannabis. Like cannabis is, like you said, it's a healer. It's, it's something that provides us balance within our bodies. So why could it not also provide us balance within our socioeconomic spaces as well, right? And so having strength within diversity, having different uh, points of views is very important. But as well, building that network, building that domestic, but as well, international network is that much more important. So um, I think we're going into a good space. Yes, there's going to be challenges. Yes, there's going to be obstacles. But we're going into a good space. And I actually am excited to see the change that's going to come. So um, let's just hope that everything goes well, especially up here in Canada. We're working really hard with our partners to make sure that this can actually actually come to fruition and we're really excited about this opportunity 
Well, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Jamie, any uh, final closing thoughts? I think that there needs to be a change fundamentally in what we consider qualified. Because what happens in my life a lot is when I am, you know, saying we need to go add a person of color to our board or to go find a person of color for our executive team. Um, the comment I get is, shouldn't we find the most qualified person? Well, part of the problem with that notion is that uh, how do you get a pool of qualified applicants who've got former board experience if 20 years ago, people of color weren't allowed or, you know, 50 years ago, women weren't allowed to have bank accounts. We weren't allowed to own real estate. We weren't allowed to vote. So we certainly weren't sitting on boards of public companies. So you don't have this historical uh, churning of qualified applicants. So there has to be a place to start. And it starts with saying, okay, um, maybe what we're going to do in this particular case is have the qualifications look a little bit different so that we can start providing experience um, to people that don't have it, that don't come with it. Because I find it interesting to, to talk about um, when we're talking about giving access, when we're talking about providing opportunities, there's this concept that there are those of us, and let's be honest, it's white people who hold all of this power and we get to give access. But the reality is it isn't ours to give. The power, it really shouldn't belong to us. It's like you said, Barrington, the, the system's working exactly the way it was designed. So in order for us to redesign the system, we have to really look at that framework and we have to be challenging ourselves. I, I, I constantly think about things like the concept of a black movie. It doesn't, well, yeah, I understand that if Spike Lee's making a black movie do the right thing or something like that, I get that that's a genre, but it automatically puts movies like Mission Impossible, we don't call that a white movie, right? right. So then all of a sudden we have, we have literature and then we have black literature, and I, I just think that that constant concept of the other and the yep. otherness, we need to be looking at that and constantly questioning who who's sitting in the position of holding this power and is that proper? And I think those are, I mean, maybe some esoteric conversations, but I think it isn't enough to be giving a little bit. I think we need to be looking at broad changes and I think Ashley made a really great point. It's that we have an opportunity now to really make some of these changes and execute some of these things. But it starts with having an awareness of maybe that this isn't a black problem. It's not a BIPOC problem. It's not a women problem. And I'm not saying that that white men are evil. I'm just saying that they held the power in the beginning and it's time for some of that to change. And we've got to do that through awareness and through having conversations like these. No, thank you. Um, I, I remember when I used to hear the term black on black violence, it's like, what else is going on then? Like, I don't hear other terms. Um, so, so yeah, I know exactly where you're coming from. And again, it's to reiterate that point. I just want the term movies. I just want the term literature. I just want the term businesses. Um, but you know, changes changes slow and it's better now than it was 25 years ago um and it'll be better in the next 25 years i truly truly believe that uh emma patient when people are like we're making progress it's like we're making progress well why don't we just fix it yeah no i <laughs> totally agree and uh and we are on our way uh emma any any closing thoughts any closing ideas yeah, I think just especially in reflection of this being a cannabis focused uh, conversation around social equity, we are a very risk tolerant group. We've gotten into this industry in the first place. So I think I really want to encourage anyone watching um, to implement that same mentality when we think about um, 
being more critical of the lens in which we approach the world. So not being afraid to do the work, to learn and unlearn just the way we have in cannabis and with our business is to have that self-reflection internally. Um, I'll put out the word intersectionality for anyone that's unfamiliar with it is just to really understand the place of privilege in which you might come at any of these issues, but also the ways that you may have also experienced prejudice. We all have that intersectional lens. So I encourage everyone to be a little bit more fearless in the face of this conversation and um, do the do the work yourself to understand where you're coming at this conversation and the opportunities that you personally have and how you can show up. And I think, yeah, just coming back to us being in this industry, we are a very progressive group. We are um, very fearless in many ways. So harness that and we can do better. Uh, thank you, Emma. And thank you, Ashley Athill, uh, Jamie Pearson, and Emma Andrews for taking the time to discuss social equity and the things that it's involved with, what they're doing, where we're headed. This was just a delight. <laughs> we will continue. But for now, this has been an episode for the Cannabis Investor Series, talking about social equity. I've been your host, Barry Miller. Thank you very much. All right. Well, uh, a lot to unpack there. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just want to relate to what Ashley said about community and just that uh, the reason we put social equity and social justice into the health and wellness um, uh, episode of CIS was for that very reason. You know, through COVID, we've, we've now seen the direct impact of community on our own personal health and wellness. So uh, I don't know. Anything you want to say about this, Jay, or, or jump on uh, before we move on to the uh, grand finale? No, just thought it was a great conversation. Always uh, willing to listen, learn, and, and help implement where wherever we can on the business of cannabis front. But I also have a lot of respect for the folks that Barrington sat down with, and we we know some of them and don't know some of them. So we're looking forward to connecting with them uh, down the road as well. Absolutely. So uh, I guess we can consider this bonus content. This is Steve D'Angelo with our own Anna Saren. Uh, this is about nine minutes long, and then we'll be back to recap and do a very quick recap and then uh, tease next week's episode. So uh, hang with us. This is Steve D'Angelo with Anna Saren. Um, I want to hear about the Last Prisoner Project. This is something that you founded. Um, what year did you found the project? I founded it in uh, 2017. Well, I got the inspiration for it in 2017. We didn't really get around till, to founding it until the early part of 2019. Okay. Um, uh, I was in Toronto. I was in the financial district. I was at the top of a beautiful building at, uh, at, in a beautiful conference room at a beautiful table. It was a great day. Everybody was looking at business plans and projections, and there was a lot of money on the table. Everybody was feeling really good my phone starts buzzing. And, you know, normally I don't interrupt a meeting like that to go take a phone call. But this case, it was my buddy, Chuck, who was calling me from a prison in Pennsylvania, where he had been in prison for four years for smuggling 14 pounds of cannabis from California to Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, I went out, I took the call in the hallway, and it was grim, because it's always grim to talk to your friends when they're in prison. And I was still feeling that grimness when I walked back into the room. And I, I, I was just struck by the difference between the feeling that I had after talking to Chuck and the feeling that was still present in the room. And I realized in that moment that I, I couldn't go forward and be part of building this legal industry, creating intergenerational wealth um, and not do something for Chuck and the thousands of other people who were in prison for doing exactly, exactly the same thing that I was doing at that conference table, but at a much lower scale. And, and, and then I realized, as I looked at all of the plans that were on that table, I started thinking about the dollars that were there. I started thinking about all the other rooms where people were having the same conversation. And I realized that we wouldn't need very much of that pile of money to get the job done. So releasing every single cannabis prisoner on this planet, and that is what the mission of the Last Prisoner Project is, 
is not just a noble crusade. It's something we can actually get done and we are getting done. So in the last six months, uh, LPP has seen some really wonderful successes, including the release of Richard DeLisi in Florida. Richard was serving a 90 year sentence for nonviolent cannabis quote unquote crimes. Um, he was the longest serving nonviolent prisoner in the United States of America. Uh, he's been released. Michael Thompson, who was released after serving 25 years of a 60 year sentence for selling three pounds of cannabis to an undercover cop in the 1990s. Uh, he was the longest serving prisoner in the state of Michigan. He has been released. But there are 40,000, more or less, more prisoners yet to go just in the United States. And we don't know how many around the world, probably millions. So um, the mission's simple. As we build this industry, let's make sure that we don't leave anybody behind, that, that everybody who's been doing this activity, no matter when they were doing it, is, is released and they get the resources they need to rebuild their lives. You know, this is, uh, I feel a bit emotional from that, Steve. <laughs> um, you know, this is a really important story to tell. Um, and as I've done uh, my reading up on it, you know, what? let's simplify what this means. What we've decided today is legal in certain jurisdictions and companies are benefiting from, investors are benefiting from, jobs are being created, tax revenue is being creative, and it has become a complete legal framework. Um, if it was not legal yesterday, there are people that could be put in prison. Um, uh, children have been taken away from their mothers. Um, young, young um, adults have been put in jail. And even if you're put in jail for a short period of time, that, that completely redirects the entire route of your future and your career um, and your family opportunities. Uh, it really has destroyed lives for something that what yesterday could have been illegal is legal today. Um, and many people are, are are getting to enjoy the benefits of it. So uh, I am so thankful that we have people out there like you doing that work. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, it, it, you know, this should be really simple, Anna, right? If we as a society have decided that something isn't wrong, that we're not going to punish people for it anymore, then you have to stop punishing the people who are being punished for the thing that you decided isn't wrong anymore. Exactly. It's, it's really simple. You yeah. would think that this would be a standard part of every cannabis legalization law, that it would be automatic. Um, yeah. It hasn't been thus far, but hopefully moving forward, we'll, we'll see that kind of change. So so can you touch a little bit on, um, this is part of the legalization within New York, correct? Yeah, and Well, in New York, they, they, they have a expungement process, which is uh, written into the law. And the word that I'm getting from the governor's office is that it is their intention to pardon every single cannabis prisoner in the state prison that they're able to identify. And so the last prisoner project is now in, in the process of attempting to do that assessment. Uh, it's sometimes challenging to figure out how, what prisoners are actually incarcerated for um, because they're typically charged with a, a long list of crimes. But we're untangling that knot right now and we're hopeful that the governor's office in New York is, is going to do the right thing. Well, this is also, um, it's not just people that are currently within, um, in prison currently. This is all, also people who are walking around, um, you know, with this on their record and they can't get a student loan. And um, it might be more difficult for them to get a job. It might be more difficult for them to get a mortgage on a house. Um, you know, these are the, the, they hang over them for the periods of their life. So it's also expunging, I think, some of those records of people that are walking freely today. Um, are you seeing this where they're going, the attempt is to expunge mm -hmm. past records of what is considered legal today if they were um, arrested for? Or that same act that it'll get expunged? Are we seeing that come in other states as well as part of their legislative changes? Depends a lot on the state. So, okay. you know, we've seen it in New York. Um, we are not seeing it in places like Mississippi and Alabama that are just beginning to reform their laws. Uh, some of the more conservative Southern states uh, are, not, are not taking that measure yet. Uh, so this is a conversation that needs to continue happening. And, you know, just to underline this, 
Um, it, it really is devastating to have any type of conviction, particularly a felony conviction. I am one of those people. Um, I have a felony conviction for cannabis, and it's been responsible for me being denied cannabis licenses that I otherwise would have been able to develop. It's been responsible for me being turned down for loans, turned down for health insurance, turned down for life insurance. Um, uh, it, um, I, I cannot even uh, hire a financial advisor to advise me on my legal investments because I've been put onto the federal government's cannabis blacklist. I am unable to open a retirement account with a retirement company for the same reason. So uh, it's really a, a, a devastating and crippling thing yeah. to happen. And expungement is, it's, 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 it's important. You know, keep in mind that one American has been arrested on cannabis charges roughly every 45 seconds for the past decades. And so we're talking about millions and millions of people walking around with a cannabis conviction. Unbelievable. Um, before I start to tear up again, Steve, because our audience doesn't need to see that. <laughs> I want to just thank you so much. Uh, again, you know, it is, I always love hearing your thoughts on, um, on everything. And I really hope that we can do this again. I definitely want to revisit our conversation after legalization in Mexico. Um, the CSC can't thank you enough for your support that you've given us over the years. Um, and can't thank you enough for, um, I think one of the things I love the most about some of the work that you do is, is I think you do a really amazing job at bringing the community of cannabis together. You put us in rooms together, you put, um, you know, small entrepreneurs in, in a room with stock exchanges and, and in the same room with somebody who will write a big check and help them develop their business to, you know, uh, people who require advocacy groups for them to be able to expunge their records or get out of prisons and everything in between. So thank you for everything that you have done, Steve. And thank you so much for being a part of our forum. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. I look, I look forward to it too. Thank you so much, Anna. Be well. I'm a sucker for Steve D'Angelo. <laughs> you're saying he's your super uh, cannabis superhero, and, and and frankly, I mean he's he's paid the you know he's paid a price to um to to do what he's done, and hopefully it is helping people because, as you mentioned, one arrest every 45 seconds was it in the U.S. over the last few decades. I mean, um, it's it's a hard number to compute how many things uh, people have been impacted and destroyed because of a misguided. Um, you know, legislation against the plant. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, it's it's not a happy note to end on, but it's a note that I think we have to end on uh, when we talk about social equity, social justice, uh, is reminding ourselves that <laughs> there are a lot of people left behind uh, as this industry evolves, and we need to do our best to to help them. Um, yeah, why is he your, your hero? Why, anything else? Uh, well, I, I uh, <laughs> grew up, that's not the right term, but like in my... Mm -hmm. mid to late twenties and early thirties, uh, lived in San Francisco. So for about 12 years, um, oh, wow. and, and Harborside and Oakland was the pioneer. Um, and there was a TV program like, uh, th that he it was like a reality show about his work at Harborside and mm -hmm. sort of what they were dealing with then. And then to see him sort of years later, you know, almost 20 years later, um, is amazing. And then during, um, lift in 2019, June is right, right after that, they went public Harborside went public on the CSE. Yeah. Um, and we interviewed Steve at, and we'd seen him a couple times down like at events and stuff. Um, but I was, I was telling you in the, in the chat that uh, my mother was watching the stream of me interviewing Steve D'Angelo and she texted me and she's something like, you're quite the fanboy. And I, and <laughs> it's true because I just feel like, like how do in what realm do something I do get to sit down with Steve D'Angelo to ask him about sort of his journey in cannabis where like, you know, obviously late to the game, you know, didn't risk prison to do what I do. You know, I, you know, what we do is what I do is relatively easy. I sit in front of a camera and ask people questions. Um, most part and run a website and do all that stuff too. But like, you know, he's really in it in the thick of things and saw where the world is going well before most people did. And so it seemed we weren't even on par, but it was great yeah. to sit down with him. And, and I think he, he does not only on the business side, have the vision and what sort of Harbor side has turned into, but also, you know, if you follow him anywhere, like he, you know, he's traveling the world to sort of, 
you know, espouse the virtue of the plant. Um, so it's, it's, it's inspiring all the time. And so it's great to see him on this form too. Yeah. And that's a perfect segue, uh, Jay, for next week's show, which is the global cannabis economy. We'll actually have more Steve uh, talking about Mexico and his, his time there and, and some of the things he sees happening in that jurisdiction. It's a very exciting jurisdiction. We're going to go all around the world next week. And uh, it's, it's been a fantastic journey thus far. And thank you for joining me for the journey today, Jay. Uh, and for having Business of Cannabis be our official media sponsor this week of the Cannabis Investor Series. Um, we always try to get these done in two hours. They always run a bit long. And uh, I do thank everyone that has stuck with us today and, and the team behind the scenes. Uh, Anna, Barrington, Anil, Phil, uh, Richard Carlton, um, the team at Sparks Publishing as well. And uh, everyone that's helped put these events together thus far and the clients that have participated and all the great speakers and guests. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. And we truly feel that, uh, again, at the CSC, we, we are the best home for these companies. And, um, you know, we hope <laughs> we hope that we can continue to uh, work with this industry for a very long time. So, uh, Jay, without further ado, I just want to thank you once more. Uh, hope you're watching next week. I, <laughs> I hope well, I that, just I, yeah. I, I'll give a plug for the Prohibition Partners people because they have yeah. their own event. It started today, but goes the rest of the week. And you should tune. I was tuning into that uh, this morning. Really, if, if you. Like the next frontier or a next frontier is certainly what's happening, not just in, in the States, but in Europe as well. And like it's it's just it's very interesting where they are vis-a-vis -vis where we are here in Canada and what they've learned and where they're taking it. So absolutely. We, we can't wait. So uh, again, next week is the, the series finale. And uh, thanks again for watching. If you're watching on YouTube right now, hit subscribe. You'll get an update as soon as that show ends up on your stream. Yeah. Smash that like button, too. That really helps. Uh, without further ado, I'm James Black at the Canadian Securities Exchange. That was Jay Rosenthal. We'll see you next week. This is the Cannabis Investor Series.